Right. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, half past, so if we can make a start. I think I'm getting a bit of echo. I don't know whether has anyone got their. Could could members all check that they've got their speakers turned off on their laptops? That would be really helpful. Okay. I think is that okay now? Are we. I'm not getting an echo now. Great. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the development committee. I'm Councillor Filmer. I'm chairman of the committee. Um, just a few uh, sort of housekeeping notes before we uh, we get underway. Um, I've not been advised that there's any planned fire drills. So again, if the alarms go off, then they are real, and you need to leave the building by the uh, fire exits, which are shown around the room. Uh, if anyone needs toilet facilities during the meeting, they're located back through the central uh, door at the rear of the room. And there are there is water uh, drinks available on the side of of the room that we're in. Um, could I just ask if any members in the room, members of the public in the room, or, or indeed people joining us online, if you could make sure your mobile phones are turned either to silent or turned off, just so they don't interfere with the uh, the sound system. Uh, I'll move on to the, uh, the the sort of general uh, information about the committee today. Um, the meeting today is again a hybrid meeting, which means that we're meeting in the uh, the canal side at uh, North Petherton, and we are also being joined by members uh, and members of the public online. Uh, we we'll just point out though that only councillors who are present in the room today are able to vote on the applications before us. Could I also just remind you that this meeting is is being recorded? Uh, uh, and we are running, so that's good. Um, the, the format of the meeting is as per the agenda that's been published, uh, and officers' presentations can be found on the, uh, the council's website for those of you who are joining us online today. Each application will be taken in turn. The officers will outline the background and detail of the application, and then there will be the public speaking time where members have registered to speak. All I will ask if, if all members, uh, when they are uh, going to address us, if you can please wait until you have got the microphone uh, to you before you do so. We can hear you in the room, but obviously those joining us remotely won't be able to hear what you're saying until you've got the microphone. And again, I would just remind you also that the microphone is turned on. You don't need to flick any switches. It will be controlled uh, from the rear of the room. If you can just make sure you indicate that you've got the microphone and then we will make sure the microphone is turned on for you. Once members have had their say as well, we'll then have the debate of, of the application before us. We'll then come to the vote. Uh, we'll need a proposer and a seconder, and then we'll take a show of hands and we will announce the result after that's taken place. Uh, I will also just introduce for those of you who are with us today who's who's with us. So to my left are the planning officers who will be uh, outlining the applications before us today. Uh, we will also be joined by some planning officers who are joining us online. To my right uh, is our Democratic Services Department, or part of it, <laughs> so um, our, our committee manager. Uh, and also, although not with us in the room, we are joined by our legal team uh, online as well, so they can give us information as and when we, we need that during the meeting. And we're also joined uh, by our uh, portfolio holder for development and inward investment. Also on the wings of the table in front of me are the councillors who are members of the committee and they will ultimately debate and decide the applications before us. If we move on then to the agenda itself, uh, first item we have is apologies for absence. Do we have any apologies today, please? Thank you, Chairman. I have received apologies from Councillor Mike Murphy, um, but Councillor Haywood is not here either. Okay, and all of the members are present. Uh, item two is the minutes of the meeting held on the 11th of January. Are there any amendments to those minutes that members wish to bring forward? If not, could I have a proposal that there are a true and accurate record? Thank you, Councillor Facey, seconded uh, Councillor Kingham. All those in favour that those should be signed, please indicate. That's clearly carried. Uh, item three is urgent business. I've not been advised of any urgent business that isn't on our agenda today, so uh, th there is none to report. Uh, item four is public speaking time for members of the public, both those who are joining us online and, and in the room. As I mentioned earlier, we'll get to each application in turn. The officers will outline that, the detail of the application. We'll then ask you either to join us in the room at the, at the table uh, or alternatively, I'll ask you to engage your microphone online. 
I would just remind you that you have three minutes to address the, the committee with your comments. For those of you in the room, you'll see that we have a, a clock on the front which counts the time down, uh, and that will, uh, if you can draw your comments to a close by that time, that would be very helpful. For those of you who are joining online, you may be able to see the clock online, but it will. I'm, I'm not certain. So what we will do just to make sure is that when there's a minute of the time left to go, I will briefly interrupt you just to say that there is one minute left to go. Uh, and again, if you can draw your comments to a close, that would be really helpful within that time. Item five is declarations of interest. Are there any declarations that we have today for today's yeah. business, uh, particularly this morning's business? Councillor Pierce, we'll start with you. Chair, um, yep, um, items on page 80, the Northgate uh, application for Bridgewater and page 85, the road lane application for Bridgewater. Personal interest as a member of Bridgewater Town Council. And just to confirm, you've taken no part in any discussions. That's fine. Councillor Granter. Yes, good morning, Chairman. Thank you. Yes, the same uh, personal interest on page 80 and 85 as a member of Bridgewater Town Council and no part in any applications. Thank, Thank you everyone. very much. Councillor Revens, if someone could, it's just behind your laptop, this lap, sorry. Thank you. Um, uh, page 68, it's a personal interest. Uh, I was the head of year at East Bridgewater School of the Architect for five years, so I know I knew, I knew him when, when he were a lad. <laughs> Councillor Kingham. I think it's already covered, but as a member of the drainage board. Yeah, we'll do that as a, for, again, just to confirm for, for, for members who are joining us online. For any member who is a member of the drainage board, we will record that they they are members of the drainage board, but have taken no part in, in any of the discussions on planning applications, because it's it's not normal that members would get involved with, with that at the drainage board level. If, on the other hand, members have been involved, they will declare that they have had that involvement and, and therefore would take no part in the discussion. Councillor Betty. Yeah, the application on page 68 in board rep is in my um, district ward. I've took no part in any of the debates. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, same. I'm the ward member on page 68 and took no part. <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, Ms. Lehman, you wanted to comment? Thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Kingham, what was the um, application under where um, you're a member of the drainage board, please? I, I think, Dawn, it was, it was a general declaration that if there are any applications, he's taken no part in, in any of the discussions on drainage board. So it's, it's part of the general um, that members of drainage board are, are not taking a, a, a part at that level. So there, there was no, I don't think there was a specific application, but it was just the general declaration that he was making, which we will do anyway. That's absolutely fine. Thank you. OK, thanks. For, for members of the public, both here in the room and, and also joining us online, it's important that if there's any background that members have to an application that they make, make that clear. Uh, where you've heard members are part of a, a town or parish council and have taken no part in the application, that's because we have a standing order within this committee which says that to avoid what's called predetermination, in effect, making your mind up before you come to the committee, you shouldn't be involved at the decision making level at both the town and parish and the district level. So you have to make that choice. And where you've heard members to declare today that they have not taken any part at town and parish or in fact at the drainage board, that's to make sure that they can take part within the meeting today. Uh, uh, equally, where you've heard a, a personal interest, it's so that someone's got some background, but it's not to a level that it would actually prejudice their views. It's mentioned, it's recorded, but they can still be part of the decision making process had someone which they haven't today made a prejudicial declaration it in effect means that their their views would be prejudiced by the knowledge that they have maybe it's a close personal friend or a relative and on that basis they would have to leave the room and not be involved in the decision making process at the Sedgemore level members that then brings us to the end of the uh, declarations of interest so i think that moves us on to our, our <coughs> Yes, the first application we have speakers present, which is on page 37. And I think, Mr. De Vries, you're introducing this one. Yeah, I will. OK, I will certainly mention that. I have just been reminded that uh, that there is one application that we have before us on page 26, which actually has been withdrawn from our agenda 
uh, because there is further information awaited. Uh, that one will be coming back to a future committee uh, in due course. So that's all right. So if we move then to page 37 and hopefully Mr. DeVries, you can introduce that one for us, please. Thank you very much. Um, so just as an update following the publication of a report, there is an amendment to the drafting of the noise condition um, because a revised noise assessment has been submitted to environmental health, which has now been agreed. Um, just updating the new the noise assessment that they have to um, carry out the works in accordance with and require a verification of the report after um, they've concluded work. So that's an update to condition 16 um, beyond what's been published. So the application itself is before planning committee as there's an objection from the parish council um, as the development's considered to conflict with policy H2 and H3 of Nether Stowey neighbourhood plan and due to the lack of affordable housing, which also is considered to conflict with policy D6 of the local plan for lack of affordable housing, um, and the nature of the application being a section 73 rather than a full application, which I'll explain a little bit later. Um, and Councillor Pay and Councillor Caswell have also objected to the application, again, on reduction of affordable housing, and that the access connection in itself wouldn't be a community benefit that would justify the release of this site. So this application, um, this slide just shows the application site outlined in red. The application has already been granted planning permission for 109 dwellings, which previously included 15% affordable housing, public open space, the conversion of the granary building on site, um, and the backward L-shaped sort of area projecting to the rear of the site has already been approved as ecological mitigation, um, which is covered by conditions and the section 106. The application um, effectively seeks to vary the approved plans now to bring them in line with the conditions that have already been discharged, um, but also to remove um, affordable housing from the development due to, unfortunately, viability issues now not making it um, a viable development site. So some of the letters have raised comment on the infilling of the pond, um, which just for members' information is this area to the back. That falls outside of the application site and it's outside of the control of the developer. It was not infilled by the developer, but it is subject to separate enforcement um, investigation. So this is an aerial photograph of the site um, prior to it being cleared um, and showing the access onto the A39 and a range of industrial and former agricultural buildings that were on site. Um, the buildings, with the exception of the granary building, which is this large building with a red tile roof here, um, have now been demolished and the access works to the site are currently underway. So in terms of planning history, um, the original permission on this site was granted through a rural exception policy, which was within the core strategy. So it did require 40% affordable housing on the site. Um, the following permission, which is being implemented on site, was submitted under the local plan and um, identified the site as an edge of settlement site, which is acceptable in principle. And given the previously developed nature of the site, then reduce the affordable housing offer to 15% in accordance with policy. The scale and development was therefore previously accepted and then conditioned to be 15%. So following um, the 2019 consent under the new local plan, um, there's also been some non-material amendments submitted um, to make amendments to the scheme um, to try and remove stone due to viability. Um, although the application, the first application was refused and a second non-material amendment was submitted to reduce the stone but not remove it completely. So stone has been retained and there were discussions about the granary building. So in respect to this proposal, the application is submitted as a section 73. That effectively looks to vary the approved um, plans and the conditions on the original consent. The amendments to the approved plans um, do result in the removal of the affordable housing as some of the plans identified um, the location of the affordable units and some of the elevations and floor plans were specified to serve the affordable units as well. In terms of scale, layout and public open space and the mitigation land in respect of ecology, these all remain as consented for, um, in respect to the previous development. So both applications included consent for a significant junction arrangement that introduces traffic lights and a safe pedestrian crossing. Um, this would enable future residents to access the facilities of the village and enable safe access from the village to the church. Um, development on this access has commenced and works currently underway, so I can show you photos of how that's developed. 
And this is the ecological mitigation area towards the rear of the site, um, which has measures specified by conditions and within the 106 to ensure enhancements. In terms of design and appearance of the development, there's a range of property types with differing features in terms of sills, um, coins, porches and bay windows. And the materials on site also comprise a mix of render, brick and stone. So stone has been retained in the um, principal focal points going through the site. The application also provided a detailed landscape assessment and mitigation, including comprehensive planting, um, including a number of general um, and orchard trees, native hedgerows, formal hedging, um, in addition to the immunity, sensory and ground cover and bulb planting as well. All details have been found acceptable by the ecologists and by the landscape officer. Um, so these are some site photos of the access, which is currently under construction. Uh, the top photo is taken from the access into Nether Surrey, um, which was closed on my day of the site visit. And the bottom image is um, just a view looking east. Uh, top image is a view looking across um, the access to the development that's currently under construction. And the bottom image is taken from the car park area looking over the construction site. So the same locations is a view looking northwest with the granary building that's been consented for conversion and to the north um, just panning around from the granary barn. So as you can see, there's a significant amount of work that's been undertaken on site to date. So this plan um, shows the front and rear of the granary building, um, which has been retained as part of the application. In terms of viability, there were discussions with the developers before this application, um, just considering the escalation of the cost of the junction, labour, materials, and the impact that this was having on the development. Um, reviewing the cost of the development, um, amendments to the application were explored in respect of materials and potential demolition and rebuilding of this particular building, um, which would be more um, efficient. But the changes for the demolition and rebuild were resisted, um, as we felt retention of this building um, was important, and the quality of materials was also um, sort of pushed back on so stone was retained on site but ultimately this did also influence the viability of maintaining the affordable housing as per the original requirement. So consideration for this application falls solely to the viability considerations and whether members are satisfied that the scheme has demonstrated that it could not afford and um, could not support to um, could not support affordable housing. So the application in itself has been subject to an independent appraisal, which has been added online to the file, although this was not available when the application was originally submitted. Um, this report was jointly commissioned, um, but is an independent assessment, which the LPA and the developer jointly agreed to be bound by the conclusions for. The appraisal was undertaken by um, Kai Ann and was based on the latest planning practice guidance and the latest RICS guidance with Sedgemore offering to take on the affordable housing as the affordable housing provider, there still remained a shortfall in the viability even after the agreed, uh, even after the agreed amendments, um, which would basically mean there's a shortfall of 6,674. Um, so the viability report concludes that sales income minus costs, including acceptable standard profits, um, makes the provision of affordable housing at the 106 level of 15%, which is 16 homes for this site, um, unviable. So when a residual land value at least equating to its benchmark value is required. So to achieve the benchmark value as set out in planning practice guidance, it is not possible to provide any affordable homes unless either the 106 costs are reduced by a comparable level or grant can be input into the scheme. So as such, whilst it's disappointing that the developer has demonstrated that the site is not viable with affordable housing, this can be accepted through policy D6, the local plan, and H2 of the neighbourhood plan, if we're satisfied it's been demonstrated through the viability. Many comments have um, raised that the cost of the junction would always have been a requirement for the site but the developers could not have safeguarded against the scale of increase in the cost, particularly in the given, given the current circumstances. The developer has confirmed that they're happy for a review clause to be added to the deed of variation to amend the 106, which would address concerns um, raised from some individuals in terms of increased house prices um, would equalise out any increased development costs. 
in terms of wider benefits, consenting the development would enable the continued delivery of 109 homes, um, which would otherwise stall and um, is currently helping the council meet the housing delivery test. The provision of access would also increase accessibility to and from the site and the adjoining church, um, which would also benefit those outside of the application site. So as such, officers are satisfied that the viability issues have been demonstrated and that the wider benefits would warrant the support of the proposal. Outside of planning, there are HPC funds that can be used to supplement the shortfall in finance and a bid can be put into Homes England that would result in the affordable housing once again becoming viable. But as said, this is outside of the planning process. We're only looking at whether the viability information has demonstrated it can support affordable housing. Um, unfortunately, to apply for the Homes England grant, the 106 needs to be clear of the provision of affordable housing to enable that to occur. So at the moment, there isn't any certainty in terms of the fallback because the Homes England grant can't be applied for until the 106 is issued on any subsequent deed of variation. So as a section 73, um, the application seeks to vary some of the approved plans, although detailed areas for consideration um, listed above remain as previously considered as acceptable, subject to the recommendations of conditions and the, the obligations in the 106. If members resolve to grant the application, it will be subject to a deed of variation to the 106 to link this application removing the requirement for affordable housing but adding a viability appraisal to ensure that in the event that the development performs beyond expectations then affordable housing contribution can be taken the main consideration in this case is the principle of development in respect of the proposal delivering zero percent affordable housing in accordance with policy the application has submitted a viability appraisal which has been independently reviewed in line with the latest guidance and has ultimately confirmed that the site cannot currently support affordable housing. For the reasons set out within the report and through the presentation, um, officers are satisfied that there are wider planning benefits that would justify consenting this development and subject to a deed of variation to the application is therefore recommending approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, as you'll see, we have a, a number of speakers. So if we could start with uh, John Roberts, please. Good morning. Just confirming you're speaking on behalf of the Parish Council today. Yeah, John okay. Roberts, Chairman of the Parish Council. Excellent. And again, you'll see the clock on the front. Start whenever you're ready to go, please. OK, thank you, Chairman. OK. Another story, Parish Council stands by all our comments made in writing, but wish to add the following. We're our understanding of the rules governing councils, what my councillors may consider is that the application has to be judged on its own merits and any decisions must be reached based solely on the application being considered at the time. Therefore, we cannot see how arrangements outside of the planning process can be considered. Reference has been made by the applicant to the cost of the signalised road junction as being a factor in this application. The works to construct the road junction were subject of a totally separate application to that being considered today. Therefore, again, we do not see how it can form part of the present application or be considered as such. Also, we are aware of the opinion that any developer wishing to build on the north side of the A39 at Netherstowe would have had to construct a signalised junction in the interest of safety in any case. We'd also like to draw attention to the large response from residents of Netherstowe voicing their objection to this application. Although the comments may not be phrased in correct planning speak, the volume of comments demonstrates the overwhelming sentiment of disappointment and fury at the developer for seeking to remove affordable housing, which is sorely needed in our community and which formed a great part of the publicity to the village by the developer prior to the application being submitted. We feel that the key argument of this variation is that providing affordable housing is not financially viable. It needs to be recognised that the viability in this case is not whether delivering the affordable housing would cause the developer to lose money, but rather a development is not deemed viable if the profit margin for the developer is not large enough. If this application is granted, it would indicate that profitability takes precedence over the needs and requirements of the local community. Such is the scope of this application that the parish Council firmly believes it should be a new application to be judged on its own merits. 
an application for development of 109 dwellings, which increases the size of the community by nearly 15%, that delivers no affordable housing and provides absolutely no local community benefits, should be denied. Therefore, the Parish Council and the majority of the residents of Netherstowe request that this application be dismissed. Thank you, Thank Chairman. You. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Councillor Caswell, if you'd like to come forward. Again, Councillor Caswell, start whenever you're ready, please. Okay, thank you. Members, thank you for letting me speak today. It's a very sad that I have to come here to oppose this application. I will not, re I will not go over the uh, the uh, statements made by the chairman of the parish because I will not reiterate what he is. I will reiterate what he says, but uh, I will not um, repeat anyway. <coughs> Yet again, we have a developer that's seeking to remove the much needed affordable housing, not only here, but in the, especially in Nether Stowey. Again, without scant regard and little respect for the needy people uh, of Nether Stowey and Sedgemoor District Council in general. There is a red herring here. They're blaming the, the affordability of the junction and everything like that. Whoever built on that site would have had to have made those adjustments to the to the A39. No ifs, no buts, they would have had to have done it. There has been deaths there for many, many, many years, as I know. The Parish Council and the residents of Nederstowe have, have offered every assistance to the developer, only to be stabbed in the back for the sake of sheer profit. And that's what it is, it's sheer profit. It's that their mathematics when, they're, when their surveyors did the site is not a concern for us. The concern for us is the affordable housing and what is needed. I'm afraid this is yet another case of get planning permission and do what you like, which seems to be an epidemic. We've seen it for years, but it seems to be coming along a lot more now. I repeat that. Another case of get planning permission and do what you like, and then tart it up afterwards with the usual. Well, I won't say what I was going to say there. I ask you members to reject this application and ensure that all developers, both now and in the future, commit to their promise to deliver affordable housing and not try to renege out of it. Thank you very much. Thank you. And the next speaker is uh, Bill Richardson, please, if you'd like to come forward. Morning, Mr. Richard. Again, just to remind you, you've got the three minutes. You'll see them on the clock, and please start when you're ready. Morning. Thank you. Thank you, Chair and members of the committee. Um, I've come from Strongbox Homes today to speak about this application. By way of background, through, pre through the pre-application consultation taken originally in 2019, it was evident that the following would be priorities for the village. Firstly, delivery of much needed new affordable homes, and secondly, early delivery of a safe entrance to the village in the form of a light controlled junction in the context of numerous fatalities along this part of the A39. In early 2021, Tender costs for the junction works had increased significantly from 440,000 to, at its current state, 1.1 million, with more to spend. With your officers, we have explored alternatives to reduce costs. Strongbox immediately made officers aware of the unfolding situation and looked to see what savings could be made. Discussions were held around redevelopment of the threshing barn within the site instead of restoration and opportunities to reduce the use of natural stone. Both approach, approaches resist, were resisted on heritage grounds as evidenced in your officer's report. By way of background to this application and deed of variation, there have been two goals that have been common to both Strongbox and your officers. These are to retain delivery of on-site affordable homes and retain delivery of upfront junction works. 
Under policy D6, officers acknowledge that viability evidence supplied by Strongbox does not support the delivery of any affordable homes. Notwithstanding this, Strongvox has proactively entered into dialogue with officers to build the 16 plots identified for affordable housing under the current planning permission and reserve these homes to allow Sedgemoor District Council to purchase them for the sole purpose of affordable housing through combination of EDF funding and homes and community grant funding. I am pleased to note that the alternative funding route was ratified by your full council last Wednesday. So in conclusion, this deed of variation is before Sedgemoor District Council uh, because currently homes um, community agency funding cannot be drawn down whilst the affordable housing is identified in the planning permission, which is currently undeliverable. Hence, although the delivery is being removed as a requirement from the planning permission, the affordable homes can still be delivered as via an alternative mechanism. Thank you. Thank you very much. Before I come to members, I'm going to come back to Mr. DeVries, if I can, just to address the issues that have been raised, particularly relating to the viability, um, new application in Section 73, and, and also the issue of, of alternative provision and where that fits into our debate today or whether it doesn't. Yeah, so in respect of the section 73, apologies, I was just say I was going to come on to it and didn't. Um, the application has been granted for 109 dwellings. This is an application to vary the approved plans connected with the 109 dwellings. So condition two on the original consent ties the developer to the approved plans as part of the original planning permission. On the approved plans, there is a particular plan that's got red dots on it that shows which affordable homes are going to be delivered where because we like to pepper pot them out through the development. And some of the elevations and floor plans specifically refer to affordable homes. So the variation to the approved plans is to remove reference of those plans in terms of the consented development. The other list of conditions that's on the front sheet, because I'm, I'm aware it's quite a long list, is because those conditions were pre-commencement. So those conditions have already been discharged as work has started on site. So they are being amended to be compliance in accordance with the details that have been provided. So effectively, this is a section 73 because it's looking to vary some approved plans and just amend the conditions that have already been discharged. It's the same scheme that's already been um, approved for 109 dwellings, which is why it's a section 73 and not a full new application. In terms of background, um, for planning purposes, and in accordance with D6, what we have to look at is the viability of the development and the viability appraisal that's come in. And the question for members is, are we satisfied based on the viability information we've got that it's been demonstrated that the site cannot afford to deliver affordable housing? That's the planning question. Outside of planning, the council is looking to take on the affordable houses. So they have um, given the price that we would give them as an RSL to take on a, as a local landlord, if you like, for the affordable housing. So we've told them what the market price of those houses would be. And then there's a difference. There's still a shortfall if the council took on those houses of X. And there's background um, outside of planning negotiations going on in terms of whether grant funding from um, Hinkley and another sort of subsidy from Homes England can be drawn down to meet the shortfall so that we can still secure the delivery of the affordable housing. That's outside of planning because it's not part of the planning debate. The planning debate is under policy D6. Have they demonstrated that the site as it currently exists can or cannot support affordable housing? So the, the recommendation before members, the reason it's raised is so that you're aware that there is still a background intention of delivering it, but it's not certain because at the moment we can't secure um, Homes England drawdown funding until there's 106 that doesn't require affordable housing because that's how they make the, the grant available through Homes England. So at the moment, it's not certain that the planning process is with the viability information we've got, are we satisfied in accordance with policy D6 for planning purposes that they've demonstrated that if, if we were saying, no, you have to deliver affordable housing on this site, is the site viable, yes or no? So the independent appraisal we've had back concludes that it isn't, but that's the debate before members today. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions from members, please? We'll start with Councillor Evans.
Uh, good morning and thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, and, and thank all three speakers for their contribution this morning and officers for their their report. Um, we are clearly in a in, in a choice of in a, in a very difficult position with this one. Um, nobody, I think, wants to see this site delivered without the affordable housing in place. Um, I've got a number of questions that I'd like to understand a little bit more fully. Um, we are being told under policy D6 that uh, we've got the independent um, uh, viability review. Are we as members able to scrutinise or review that document, please? It's public and live on the application. So yes, it's, it is publicly available. Okay, thank you. Um, I, would, I, I wasn't aware of that and didn't see that reference in the papers. So I would have liked the opportunity to have re read that and understood it fully in advance. Um, I'm, I'm, did I miss something or was it referenced? Um, it, it was referenced in the paper in terms of the headlines. Um, it was published, um, I think, two weeks ago, but on the original history file. So it would have been on 3619. Okay. And it was published middle of last week on the live current application. Right. But were members signposted to it? Because we're being asked to make a decision as to whether this is viable under D6. Um, to do that, I think we need to have read and understood that document. My concern, I, I had understood that document to be confidential. I didn't know it had been published and I would have read that document before this meeting had I known. Um, I had, uh, obviously, there's been a mis misunderstanding. I thought that was that was confidential and it's very difficult to, to say this is compliant under D6 without having read that document. Yeah, apologies, it's online. I, I didn't send a, a separate notification to the committee to let them know that. Okay. Um, I think this this does put us in, that puts me in a little bit of a dilemma in terms of supporting this um, this morning, because I would want to, un to fully understand that document, because that's what we're being asked to do. Um, the question that I wrote down um, when, was, would this site have been compliant with policy without the affordable housing? Um, elements of it. Um, I think it was, it's one of those major developments. I, I, my re recollection is it didn't come to committee because ward members and parish council supported and then the officers supported. And it's one of those difficult situations where I think we'd have been more familiar with this application had it come before us in committee. And maybe that's a a, a, loop, a loophole in the system. It, it, it's come to us but, but quite late in the day. Uh, which which is difficult for us to to perhaps um, contemplate. I'm also interested to understand um, the story, I believe, is a tier two settlement. And I notice on uh, policy T2A, it has an allocation of a uh, minimum allocation of, I think it's 75 houses mm -hmm. on the table. Um, is that allocation deliverable without this site? Um, there aren't any other alternative sites that deliver that scale of development and um, the number set out as a minimum. So previously under well, the indeed. delegated approval, we, we found it acceptable. It was a brownfield development site on the edge of the settlement boundary and obviously delivering the um, wider sort of planning benefits that have been outlined as part of the presentation. Okay. Um, I think, think members have been put in a very difficult position mm -hmm. here. I'd be interested to see what other members say I cannot support this site going forwards without the affordable housing components. Um, I don't believe it would have been passed by this development committee without it. I don't clearly the parish council and ward members wouldn't have, have, have supported it without the affordable housing element. I have a, a great deal of difficulty in supporting the officer's recommendation and I look forward to hearing other members' views. Thank you. Thank you. I think I've just cleared. Councillor Bolt. A very brief one. <clears throat> when was the viability study completed? Um, the actual report uh, really helpfully isn't dated. Um, but, you know, a number of months ago, because it's it was an issue got, that got raised with us um, probably about March last year. So we've been working with the developer in terms of trying to find solutions until then. Um, the options we were looking at previously were non-material amendments in terms of how you can um, reduce the construction costs of the development going forward. 
but given the alternative options available to us in terms of the potential for um albeit outside planning the potential for affordable housing to be taken on by our own in-house team and the potential for additional grant to be going into it we felt the design quality of the development was more important to try and retain with the ability of trying to put grant into it so then you deliver the same outcomes but a higher quality the, the reason i ask is um as councillor evan says without seeing the study when it goes from 4.4 million up to 1.1 million um over a year ago when interest rates weren't to every or cost of living wasn't that much higher um than it has been for years how have they made such a a, a huge error apologies the report is actually dated 25th of may 2021 it was just at the back of the document rather than the front so apologies for that yes yeah, i stand by what i said just to confirm the, the, the change in in cost of the of the highway works that is a a change that's been informed by the the highways authority unfortunately the the original costing they had was informed by the highway authority the revised costing as being constructed is live costing as the con, as the junctions going in so it is very unfortunate but it is it wasn't a guess in terms of the highway costing it was provided to them by somerset county council and now obviously they've got the actual costs because the junction is going into place okay councillor pierce thank you chairman um i share concerns raised when i look at the um, proposal before us it says to seek removal of affordable housing provision from the development mm -hmm. it doesn't say anything about the background discussions uh, where the intent is not certain, it may may happen or it may not. And without some more assurance that there is some other route of providing it within the proposal, I think this place is in, in an impossible position. I mean, the original permission was granted on the basis largely of the inclusion of the affordable housing. And to think that the developer um, seemingly hadn't met, planned enough to take into account the the highways works which inevitably would have happened um it it doesn't sit right and so i um i would have i would find it impossible to support the application as it stands i think i think the difficulty we we will all have is that in effect, we're, we're looking at a scheme that has changed on the ground in, in terms of the provision of, of the junction. That's something that was out with the control of the planning department or the developer. The costs have escalated um, way beyond what they were expected. And the difficulty we have in terms of future provision of affordable housing is that all we can be looking at is, are they able to justify the fact that the development as proposed is no longer viable? And I totally understand where the parish and, and ward member are coming from in terms of what does viability mean. But in terms of planning, viability doesn't mean does it break even. It means does it allow for a, a level of profit? And that's what we have to be basing our in, inference on, not whether we think it's viable. But we do have, obviously, an independent assessment, which is what is the normal process that we carry out with any of these sites. And I fear, to be brutally frank, in, in terms of the, the current financial climate, this may not be the only time we see applications like this coming before us, but we have to respond to the world as it is rather than the way we would have liked it to be. So the decision we have to make today is in effect, as, as the officers outlined to begin with, is has this application shown with the independent viability check that this site isn't viable as was originally proposed? In terms of the what goes on outside of that, that's where another part of this council will hopefully pick up the slack and deal with with that issue. But unfortunately, we can't take that into account as part of our our decision. All we can look at is the viability of the application that's in front of us and the figures that have been submitted and and obviously independently verified by a qualified viability uh, finance organisation. Councillor Scott. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. I agree with what actually has been said, but um, with regard to the viability statement, it's dated March 21. Is that right? 
May. May, sorry. Yeah. 21, which is nearly a year ago. Okay, um, prices have gone up, but yeah. so have the value of houses. So is it possible to have an updated one fairly quickly? Um, you think, in, in terms of value of prices, it was one of the things that came through all the objections that, you know, whilst costs have increased, so value of houses, um, since the viability appraisal was done in May, building costs, construction costs have only continued to go up. So, you know, yes, value of houses potentially also go up, but that would be the point of in, incorporating the review in the 106. So the deed of variation would incorporate an end of development review to see whether the increased cost of housing actually delivers a lot more favourably than what it does at the moment. Based on a snapshot in time from May 2021, the development could not provide affordable housing and it was demonstrated through the independent viability assessment. In, in the event that, you know, notwithstanding further increase in costs of the development, that at the end of it, you know, profit outstrips everything, the profit is set through the viability appraisal. So it's not that if the scheme does well, the developer does even better. It was independently reviewed at a set level. And at the end of it, there's a review process to review it again and see if there's any uplift. And that's the point of putting it in the deed of variation. This is just accepting it based on the appraisal information that we've got. Thank you, Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Councillors. We, as a planning committee, we don't base things on uh, how much a house is worth or what it's going to cost. And we don't even base it whether the developer makes a profit or not. It's nothing to do with it. All we have to look at is what's on the table, uh, what's surrounding that from the committee, from developers. As this stands here just now at the minute, albeit the affordable housing is a bit of an issue, it's not a big enough issue to stop this. If I was just speaking for myself and for one person, Although it's not an ideal project, I would still actually go with it and say, well, it has to be. Everybody's done their figures, the developer's done it, the architects, yourself as a, as, as a hierarchy in here. Uh, it's very difficult to go against it. If we go against this now today and say, no, it's not, two things. Housing stock is a big problem then, because as it is, it's, it's okay for housing stock. If we refuse this, the developer's going to come back at us. They are. There's no doubt about that at all. If it goes to judicial review, okay, we, we all know the consequences, which are not good at all. Everybody's done their figures. They've all assessed the situation. As it is, it's actually, it's not ideal, but it's acceptable. And on the basis of what I just said, I bring forward the recommendation for to grant permission. Thank you. Thank you. So just confirm that was proposed in the recommendation. Yeah, okay. Yeah, Mr. Howlett. Thank you. We just come back on the on the, the point about the, um, uh, the the report actually, and I, I do agree with Councillor Revens actually that we probably would have been better off to signpost it in the report. It is referenced in there. It does set out that it's been independently assessed. The affordable housing managers' comments are really important in that as well. Raise no objection. In fact, goes further in his comments and says that he has worked with the. Um, that the person who's undertaken that viability assessment for a long time has significant faith in their ability to do an independent review and take that into account. And that's come from the affordable housing manager. So, you know, I think we can take a great deal of confidence in that independent valuation. I, I'm not sure whether members are in the right position to be able to have the expertise with respect to undertake their own assessment of that valuation exercise. And that's why we have to rely on the consultants, which is why we, we get an independent review. It's written into the policy that we do that, and that's what we've done in this case. So, But I do take Councillor Revan's point of view, actually a signpost in the report, which would clearer to say that is publicly available, would have been better. But I think ultimately the assessment we're making today is, is the independent exercise um, robust enough for us to have confidence in, in that it's, um, that the delivery of affordable housing isn't viable? The outcome for the affordable housing manager and from officers is it is, and I'm not sure if you're in an alternative scenario to, to say you don't agree with that, that you're going to be able to take that much further in an appeal situation, etc. Because we've already got an independent valuation which we have accepted. So it is really disappointing because I think, again, Councillor Evans made the point previously, this didn't come in front of committee because the scheme 
was so positive and it is really unfortunate we're in this situation now where we've got significant numbers of objection um, and uh, and obviously the ward member of the parish council speaking against a scheme which will provide significant benefits significant housing in a village that has recognized for a long time i remember through core strategy discussions that actually want to deliver housing because they haven't delivered anything for some significant time so it is really disappointing from that point of view and i think really uh, you know to pull the other side into it the non-planning because the planning side for you today is you know has the independent valuation demonstrated that it's unviable with affordable housing the other side of it is looking at how integrated we are as a council in terms of the planning service and housing enabling to be able to provide opportunities to address these shortfalls and these difficulties in development in, in the development industry I mean, members will know through discussions at full council, our own development uh, exercises always result in increased costs because it's a really difficult, risky business. And I suppose from this point of view, you know, the discussion today is, it, do we accept that there are difficulties in viability on this scheme? Yes, we do. Is it unfortunate? Of course it is. If there's an estimate of 440,000 given by the county council in terms of the cost of the works, but when you're actually doing it, it, it's increased by, I think it was 800,000 in the report. I mean, that, of course, is a disappointment. And it's not about necessarily saying who's to blame for that. It's about dealing with the, the circumstances. From a planning point of view, we've got an independent assessment of viability. The policies say we need to take that into account. Are there wider planning benefits? Of course there are. The alternative would be a stored site, without a doubt. They've already started on the site. So from that point of view, that's really where we're coming from as officers in terms of viability. But I do take Councillor Rebbe's point about the report. Thank you. Are there any other further comments or questions? At the moment, I have a proposal in front of me. I don't have that seconded as yet. Is there a seconder? Councillor Grimes, thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, very difficult position that we're in here. Um, I understand the reasons very well, and I'm very disappointed that there is no affordable houses, but there is a possibility of that in the future. Um, taking everything into account, I will second the recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. I think, as, as other members have said, I think we're all in a, in a position that we'd rather not be starting from, but but as a as a committee we have to uh, to make these decisions um we have a recommendation that has been moved and seconded uh, all those in favor of that please show one two four five six seven thank you uh, those against please show one two three four five six seven Thank you. And that's all members, I think, have voted. So that is clearly lost. So I will be looking to members who have voted in the negative to propose an alternative proposal with the planning reasons, please. And, and all I would say to members is the issue that you had before you was viability. So we can't start looking at highways impact or design or those because that wasn't the issue so structure community benefit i mean I'll, I'll defer to officers but the difficulty you have in front of you members is that you've heard the argument the community benefit of affordable housing has been removed because of non-viability which is a material planning consideration that we have to take into account but as a, a plan application, a plan app, um, committee, we're here to discuss a, a plan application, not Absolutely. the financial viability of it. Well, no, part of our policy is that we have to take into account financial viability within mm -hmm. our... Uh, so that that is the... Uh, our, again, we'll we did make it, a proposal. But we did at the time when this application came in. Yeah. Councillor Romans. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. I'd like to... Um, propose a deferral on this on the grounds that policy D6 has not been complied with because of the point that was conceded by um, Mr. Hewlett um, regarding uh, members' opportunity to scrutinise the document um, for viability. 
um, and to seek further assurances on the deliverability of the affordable housing through other routes, please. Again, I'll, I'll take advice as to policy D6, but policy D6, I presume, is, is making a information available, which it was, although it wasn't specifically signposted. But yeah. I'll, I'll, if, if that's a route, I'll leave to officers to... So in, in terms of the appraisal information, the appraisal information has been independently scrutinised. We have had the conclusion back and the key headlines of the appraisal report are all summarised in the report that's before members. The information was available ahead of the committee. Um, I didn't get asked by anyone on the committee before the committee if it was available or not, but it was available publicly. Um, and in terms of, sorry, the second point was more certainty. Unfortunately, there will be no more certainty until after this application has been decided, because the Homes England grant can't be drawn down while there's an obligation for affordable housing in the 106. So it's, it's really unfortunate timing wise, but for the planning decision, we can't get any more certainty than what we've got. So the certainty we've got is that it's been to council. Council have agreed to take on the 16 affordable units. There's still a shortfall, as recognised by the council, that it cannot be delivered even if we take on the six affordable units. And there's HPC grant money that can go into it. But again, there is still a shortfall because of the cost of the construction works. So there is a requirement to draw down Homes England grant which can't be drawn down until there's a 106 that hasn't got affordable housing in it. But that's that's the extent of certainty, unfortunately, that I can give members at the time. Um, but for planning purposes, the decision is, have we done a viability appraisal? Has it been independently scrutinised? Does it justify affordable housing on this site? Or can it demonstrate that any affordable housing can be so supported on this site? And unfortunately, you know, and it is unfortunate, and, and I don't like being in this position either, but unfortunately it does say that it's not viable with affordable housing members councillor bolt the, the difficulty with regards to um i think what we're all finding is it'd be lovely if they said yes we're still going to get the affordable housing and the money's in reserves um, it committed or whatever. I, I know we can't draw down on it until the 106, but we've got no reassurances that it's there. I know what we've done at Council. To, to be brutally frank, Councillor Bolt, the difficulty is with the decision that the committee has just made, we cannot draw down the finance because we haven't agreed to remove it from the Section 106, and until it's removed from the Section 106, the grant money is not available. Okay. Councillor Bolt again, and I'll come to Councillor Rivens. Did Councillor Evans propose uh, the? Uh, yeah, if if that was a proposal, then I'm quite willing to um, second it for deferral, so that we can actually see this report. Okay, so just to confirm that, Councillor Evans, the recommendation is deferral for members to be able to view the re the the financial report that was the assessment. That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Um, as the, the, the point conceded by Mr. Hula that, 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 that some of us were under the misapprehension, it was a, it was a confidential document and wasn't accessible to us. And and I apologise to that. Um, that okay. That if, if you can just give us a couple of minutes. You know, I, I am disappointed that perhaps my words are being used against me really in terms of signposting because I think I also said quite clearly that the report refers to the independent review, the expertise which is accepted by the affordable housing manager and officers and that it's not really necessarily a, a matter for the committee to determine the ins and outs and nuts and bolts of a viability assessment, um, accepting that there might need to be some confidence. You know, there's there's that risk, isn't it? And the developer will have to make his own mind up in terms of the decision to defer or not to defer or to appeal for non-determination. 
uh, you know, it probably is unlikely given where the site is and it, this issue needs to be addressed. But I think, you know, what Mrs. De Vries has just said in terms of giving additional assurity, you've probably given reduced assurity in terms of the decision you're about to make. OK, members, I think we're, we're in the position we are, which is we have a proposal for a deferral to allow members to have a look at the information that was was available. If we do go down that route, I would just remind members that that will mean that you will have the opportunity to look at that and then this will come back to the committee for members to uh, to then have to make a decision on. Uh, but I think that's the route we have to follow from where we are with the de with the decisions we've made so far. So in which case, um, you have there's no other further comments on there at this point, I think. No. OK, and nothing from legal, so that's fine. So we have the recommendation for a deferral, which is proposed Councillor Reverend, second to Councillor Bolt, which is, as I say, to, to enable members to examine the financial documentation that has been supplied in terms of the viability that is available um, online. Uh, all those in favour of that deferral, please show. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, and those against, please show. One, two, three, four. That's clearly carried. So the item is deferred for members to have further uh, ability to look at the viability assessment, and then we will return to committee. Can we move on to the next one or take a break? Yeah, okay, so we'll move on to our next application with the speaker, which I've got on page 80. Thank you. So we move to Bridgewater, and I think, Ms Parsons, you're introducing this one? Thank you, Chairman. Which is on, on uh, online. Just Thank one you. moment. Yeah, we've got you now, Shanta. Thank you. Lovely. Um, this is an application for the conversion of a dwelling into three self-contained apartments, and it also includes the provision of a, a second floor rear extension. It is located within the town centre. Uh, it's one of a row of um, terrace properties. It's in Northgate. It's immediately adjacent to the uh, Northgate yard, which is currently under construction to the west. This is um, obviously the front elevation fronting onto Northgate with the development currently under construction. Just run through a few photographs to show the site. I think progress has been made on that. And this is the rear elevation of the existing building. It's three stories in height. Uh, immediately adjacent, you can see uh, the rear property. This, the adjacent property also has a flat roofed extension at the rear. Uh, this is just stepped further back, looking at the rear elevation. Now, this is the uh, elevations and the floor plans of the existing property. It comprises four bedrooms over three floors. It's proposed to convert the building into three one bed units. It's also proposed to provide um, an extension at the second floor level at the rear. This is just a closer up, close view of the floor plan. Each property has a living room, um, a kitchen, WC, an ensuite shower room, and a double bedroom over three floors and the, it's also proposed to provide a bin and cycle storage within the rear demolishing an existing building um, that, that was in the rear, rear yard the the building itself would have a flat roof this building is the building adjacent so that's not part of the proposal just shows the context of the proposed flat roof bin and cycle store now if we go back to the layout so the site is within the um, built up mixed use area and clearly the principle of residential development is acceptable um, in terms of the impact on highway safety there is no provision for parking with this application and there was no parking with the existing building because of its location being in the town centre and the inclusion of the cycle storage it's con it's considered that you could accommodate this property without reliance on a on a vehicle and therefore it complies with the policy d12 
In terms of um, impact on the character of the area, the rear extension that would be that is proposed is not dissimilar to the other extension that's existing next door. And it's not considered that that would have an adverse impact on the character of the area. There would be no amenity issues by virtue of the size of the extension and the windows. And the recommendation is therefore to grant consent. Thank you very much. We have a, as I say, we have a speaker on this one. So Lyndon Brett, if you'd like to come forward. Good morning. As you as you know, you've got the three minutes. You'll see the time on the clock and start when you're ready, please. Thank you. Chairman and members, I'm extremely disappointed to have to be here this morning for you, your planning officer, and for the waste of supporting officers' time because of a single objection. Your officer, right from the start when the application was lodged in December, has been extremely supportive with the only one relevant condition plans. The accommodation pressures in this town are unabated because the supply is not agile enough to meet demand due to planning strategy. Yet here, it is not your officers who create the barriers, but the single objection, yet with no one able to confirm which strand of policy the proposal does not meet, which even warranted this DMC referral. The proposal converts a tired, underused, inefficient, uninsulated four-bedroom house with no parking and rank pigeon lofts to three good-sized ensuite of one-bedroom self-contained energy-efficient flats relying on power and heating, not dependent upon fossil fuels, which is the way forward. Many town centre developments have been permitted with no refuge, recycling or cycle provision. Yet this proposal provides dedicated enclosed facilities protected from the elements and further provides planning gain by affording the adjoining property of the same where none previously provided. Citing the absence of parking for town centre provision is a misnomer and not a reason for refusal as a proposal is very clearly policy compliant. Every single amenity is all in walking distance. Alternative modes of sustainable travel are available, foot, cycle and public transport with bus stops 25 and 50 metres away respectively. Car parking on completion of this Northgate Yard scheme is within 100 metres. The Town Council appear to have a blanket policy of objecting to all town centre applications as here, which is a clearly preconceived idea, disregarding the merits of each application. Size has been cited, but one thing learned in 44 years of planning and design work is that most people cannot read plans, let alone assess size, as is the case here. Exasperated does not adequately describe how I feel, but not with your officers, but rather the misuse of the voice and platform offered in this instance, which has cost your council and administration time. Contractors have had to be stood down in acting on local livelihoods, materials placed on stop and now subject to hike in raw materials as a result of current crisis, particularly for insulation materials and overall rising costs resulting in a project increase of upwards of £10,000. The net result of the one objection is that this has created two to three months delay in delivery of much needed housing provision. Whether that is fair or equitable remains to be tested. As there is no element of planning policy with which this proposal does not comply, I would ask that you endorse your officer's recommendation and grant planning permission. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've got Councillor Kingham and then Councillor Pearce, so Councillor Kingham first. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um, I have a scheme here where we're bringing an old building back into use. Um, parking is not necessary. They've obviously thought ahead and they've got um, provisions for cycles to be stored. Uh, I have no, no problem with this and I would like to uh, move the recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Pearce. Thank you, Chairman. Um, no, I have no objection um, to this proposal. It's a really important site with the um, Northgate development right next door. But what has become apparent over the last few months, because the, the waste um, collection cannot happen at the back, it's all been moved to the front. And although the photograph you had on there was of a clear um, sort of no rubbish, what has become a clear, clear that there is a, a lack of provision for waste. Now, I'm not saying it's linked to this building, but what I wouldn't want is for this building to, to exacerbate it. And waste 
um, refuge has been mentioned. I just wondered, is the fact that the uh, waste disposal been included in the plans, is that enough to absolutely assure that will happen? Or would it be helpful for another condition? Because this is an opportunity to start clearing up that area in terms of, uh, of waste. And I'm really pleased to see there will not be reliance on fossil fuels. That's really welcomed. So I'm happy to second it, but just to be absolutely sure that the waste disposal facilities are adequate for the size of the building. Ms Parsons, can you uh, address the issue on the, the waste? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I mean, this application specifically has a bin storage facility, um, which isn't always the case with a lot of conversion applications that we received. And so, um, we, you can see the area for bin storage is included here as well as as here for the three units and they're three one bed units. In my view, that would be adequate um, in terms of waste collection. I can't comment on how that would take place. I would I would assume that um, waste is put out the front adjacent to the highway in order for bin collectors to collect, which is my experience in other areas where there are terrace properties with, um, um, you know, that, that front straight onto the pavement. Clearly, there is an alleyway along the side of the building, and so that does allow for them to not leave it out the front, but it allows for them to come through the alleyway and come through to the front of the property. Thank you. Thank, yeah, thank you. If, if, the, if the officer is assured that there's sufficient um, facilities for waste disposal, then I'm happy to second the proposal. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I actually went for a drive by, by this and I stood outside and had a look at it. Huge improvement on the building that's already there. Amenities are all taken care of. We can all see that. It's, it's there for you. And if it hadn't been seconded, I would have done it myself. No problem with this at all. Thank you. OK, I'm not seeing any other comments or questions at the moment. So we've had a recommendation to grant permission, which has been proposed and seconded. All those in favour, please show. That would appear to be unanimous. That's clearly carried. So permission granted. Right, members, if you move to page 85. And I think we're joined by Ms. Elve. You're presenting this application. Please go ahead. Hello. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Hello, members. Good morning. Um, I will just share my screen. Yeah, we've got that. Oh. OK, brilliant. Yeah, is it there? Yeah. OK. Um, good morning. So the application before members is for the retrospective consent for the erection of a wooden outbuilding to be used as ancillary accommodation for the main house. The application is before members as the town council are objecting to the application due to the lack of screening for neighbouring residents. Um, since the report has been published, I have received two letters of support from two neighbours, and this includes points about development is the developments not considered to overhang or overshadow neighbouring properties. So this slide lists the policies from the local plan that are relevant to this application. The main considerations for this application are the principle of the development and impacts on visual and residential amenity and highway safety. So the application site is in the HAMP housing estate area of Bridgewater, sited to the south of the town centre. The application site is a mid-terrace property, sited to the southeast of a Class C road. The application is for retrospective consent for the placement of a detached outbuilding to provide ancillary accommodation along the rear boundary of the garden. The building provides two rooms, a bedroom slash sitting area with a kitchenette and a shower room. The outbuilding has a curved roof and is covered with grey lightweight pan tiles. So this slide has photos from the from my site visit and also at the bottom there is a photo that has been submitted by a neighbour. So the application is for ancillary accommodation within the residential curtilage of an existing dwelling within the development boundary of Bridgewater. Can I just cut in for a minute? Oh, we, yeah. we, we, we didn't get to see the pictures. They flicked oh, on and flicked off very, very quickly. <laughs> OK, sorry. There's just a slight yeah. delay in the uh, in the processing of that's better. 
Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, so this is a householder application for ancillary accommodation within the curtilage of an existing dwelling that's within the development boundary of Bridgewater. The level of accommodation provided will not be entirely self-contained and there's still a reliance on the main property. For these reasons, the principle of the development is considered compatible with the relevant policies. In terms of the details of the development and in particular the visual impact, the building is within the rear garden of the property and therefore views of it from public vantage points are limited. It should be noted that properties in the area have detached outbuildings along the rear boundaries, similar to the siting of this development, and it's therefore considered to be in keeping. The building is considered to be an adequate distance from neighbouring properties and should not have a detrimental impact in respect of overshadowing or overdominance. The development is single storey and therefore does not allow for overlooking of neighbouring spaces. In respect of amenities of users of the building, the usability of the development, for instance, the pathway to access the building could be improved through works that could be carried out under permitted development. However, as there's still um, a reliance on the main dwelling, it's not considered to prejudice the amenities of um, occupiers of the building and be unacceptable in that respect. In respect of highway safety, the development is compatible with standing advice in relation to parking provision due to the existing parking area to the front of the property. For these reasons, it's therefore recommended that the application is granted consent due to the, due to the compatibility with the relevant policies within the local plan. Thank you. Thank you very much. And again, you'll see we have a speaker on this one. So, uh, Thomas Cliff, would you like to come forward, please? Hello, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. And just again to remind you, you've got the three minutes. You'll see the time on the clock and start whenever you're ready to go, yeah. please. So, I'm the owner of 193 Road Lane. Um, the dwelling was put in for my mother-in-law um, as she's, uh, she's got quite a few problems with autism and social, uh, you know, social dysfunctions and stuff. She, um, unfortunately, last year she had a couple of falls and we moved her up from Cornwall so we could be a full-time carers. She doesn't want to um, be reliant on this, obviously. Um, she is still quite young um, and, and she feels really bad in herself that, you know, she's lost all her independence. And this is why we've put the pod in the back garden. Um, the pod, as you can see, it, it is a little bit bigger than what we expected, um, but it is in, within compliance of um, all the other neighbouring properties that have got outbuildings as such. Um, this one is just for the fact that it's going to be living in. She is um, going to be using the cooking facilities of the house, etc. So there is no cooking facilities out in this pod. Um, so for the hence of fire risk and stuff like that is quite limited. Um, but yeah, so it, it, main reason for this is obviously just to keep her independent so she didn't have to go into a care home or as such on other, um, you know, other amenities as a greater cost to the council and stuff like that. Obviously, we, we're here today because there was one objection. Um, like I said, when, when the pod got delivered, it was built elsewhere. Um, there was a few discrepancies with the height of the building. Um, this has hereby obviously been amended on the on the documents that you see in front of you. And uh, we would like this to obviously be approved because of the issue that we've got with uh, the health reasons of my mother-in-law. So I hereby uh, obviously close my speech now just by saying obviously this is an adaption rather than a building for profit um, and it is a general thing for just to keep her safe and to make sure that we can easier you know look after her as well as we can look after my daughter as such in the main household okay. thank you thank, thank you, you very much. much thank you members any comments or questions councillor Evans to start with Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I can fully understand um, uh, what the applicant is is asking for here, um, and and would want to support the needs of his family within that. I note that the com there are comments about um, screening for neighbouring properties in the town council objection. Um, I also um, wonder if there is any way we can link um, the use of this building to be only for family members in the future. Um, I just wanted to safeguard um, us not having a different situation when, when it's no longer required for this purpose. 
Ms Elvey. Um, thank you. Yes, so the application is for ancillary accommodation and it's a householder application. So in order to use it as a separate you know, unit of um, accommodation, that would require planning permission. Um, yeah, that's all I've got to say on that, really. And in terms of, of um, landscaping and the comments that were made from the objectors? Um, I mean, I haven't included a landscaping condition because I didn't think it was relevant because whilst I appreciate you can see it from um, neighbouring properties, you know, it's just it's another outbuilding, you know, um, I mean, if that if you want to propose a screening condition, then that could be looked at. But what sort of screening would be used? You know, there's not much space um, at the back of the at the back of the building. Um, and, you know, there are a number of other outbuildings that kind of form some kind of screening in themselves. Um, so that's what I would respond with. OK, yeah. Thank think, you. Um, based on those responses, I'm 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 satisfied with this application and would like to make the recommendation, please. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Kingham and then Bolt and then Pierce. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I'd like to um second the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Bolt. Okay, and Councillor Pierce. It was just to, to clarify that that there have been um responses from the neighbours now, haven't there? That are su supportive is that kind of, are, are there any neighboring properties who uh, have st still raised obje objections Ms. Elvey? um yep so there's um two objections from two neighbors um and and those are the neighbors at the rear but there's two less of support from um two neighbors which are either sort of so either side of this property i think one of them's not immediately next door but maybe two doors up okay I'm not seeing any further comments or questions. So we have the recommendation that's been moved and seconded to grant permission. Those in support, please show. That would appear to be unanimous. Yeah, that's unanimous. Yep, that's clearly carried. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Members, I'm going to suggest we take a comfort break, if that's okay. Uh, if we restart at uh, 10 past, so um, that's about 15 minutes. So we'll start at 10 past 11. Right, members, it's uh, it's ten past, so we're going to make a, a start again, please. Right, if you can turn in your papers to page sixty-eight, members, thank you. Page sixty-eight, and we're going to hand over to uh, Ms. Chorley if you can introduce this one, please. Thank you, Chairman. Your mic's not on. Do you want to try again? Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me better? Yeah. A bit nearer. This one. Is that a bit clearer? Yep. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Um, so this application before members is for the erection of a single detached self-built dwelling with a double garage and an indoor swimming pool building um, and the formation of a new access. It's at land to the south of Sedgemoor View and um, Bath Road, Bordrip. Um, there is an update to members uh, following uh, there are two further highways conditions that uh, were omitted from the report to committee. Uh, they are that any entrance gates um, would need to be hung to be open inwards and set back a minimum distance of six metres from the carriageway uh, for highway safety and within one month of works commencing on site that the existing access, there is an existing field access there, would need to be uh, stopped up and its use permanently abandoned. So the application is before members today because we have a parish council objection on the grounds that a single large dwelling is out of keeping in terms of size and appearance and the traffic generation concerns uh, with the new access proposed to the A39. So we are a small cluster of dwellings here. Um, it's part of the parish of Bordrip. Um, it's south of the settlement of Wallabington. Uh, you've got dwellings uh, to the south side of the A39 here and to the north. And you've got the Fairview Caravan Park uh, just over to the northeast of the application site. Uh, this is just a slightly zoomed in aerial image. So you can see the application site is this, this square parcel of land here. Um, you've got uh, residential development on either side, single detached dwelling here, um, terrace of dwellings, and then some detached dwellings along here, a large uh, dwelling in a uh, plot over here, the caravan park to the northeast there, and then a, a number of detached dwellings on the opposite side of, of the road there as well. 
so just some site photos to, to give you a, an, an overview of what we've got. So this is looking to the east of the application site where the terrace of dwellings is um, and then south um, into the site. Uh, you can see the neighbouring uh, outbuilding there to the rear of their garden. This image is just taken slightly further over, looking towards the detached dwelling um, on the other side to the west um, and their garden there. And obviously you've got open land beyond. And just a couple of different images taken further into the site, looking west up towards that detached dwelling to the west, um, up towards the roadside where you've got that existing hedgerow. Um, and then a couple of uh, images just showing the kind of existing visibility that there is at the moment. Um, so here we have the application site. As I say, it's this, uh, this parcel of land here to the south of the A39, uh, opposite Sedgemore View. And we've got the detached dwelling here, a number of detached dwellings opposite, um, and some small kind of varied uh, development here. So quite a, quite a strong build line, um, terrace dwellings and, and detached dwellings along here. Now, the principle of the self build is coming forward under CO2, so it's an infill opportunity. Um, within an identified cluster of, of built form. It is, as I say, within the parish of Baldrip, um, and the applicant has confirmed a local connection is registered on the self-build register. So the application has been varied um, since it was originally submitted. So I've got some images to kind of show you the changes that have taken place since it came through to us. So the image there originally submitted shows the detached building, detached dwelling there kind of set back into the site, a uh, large swimming pool building alongside and a detached uh, garage to the fore. What we now have um, before members today is a rearrangement and a reduced size of the dwelling. So we've got a swimming pool building is located within the garden to the rear of the site. The dwelling is slightly smaller and is located more closely associated with the dwellings to the east. The detached double garage is just to its west. Access is in the same place. And this then leaves this kind of uh, scope effectively on the, on the west for um, a further dwelling should there be demand in the future. Now, part of the reason for that was that obviously we do have quite a large site here. Um, there is no further demand for any other um, a self build interest in the area with a local connection to Baldrip. So there is only scope for one dwelling in terms of demand and meeting this unmet need at this time. But we are aware that obviously the site is quite large and didn't want to rule out that possibility in the future should that demand um, come through. So again, just to look at what we originally had submitted, um, would this is what you would have seen from the roadside. So the large detached dwelling, swimming pool building with the garage in front of it. What we now have is a smaller frontage and the detached double garage um, set to the side. Now, in terms of context, we asked for a further drawing to show how this dwelling would be seen in terms of the context with the ridge heights of the neighbouring properties. So these are shown both to the east and the west. And as you can see, it is set back slightly. The road is, is higher, the, road, uh, the, the site slopes away from the roadside. They've also provided a figure drawing to show how the dwelling would sit. So we've got, this is the application site here. This is the application building if, if it was, were permitted. And you can see the, the neighboring uh, development that's there. And as I say, the development opposite and to the west. This is the rear elevation. So we've got solar panels um, to the roof of both the dwelling and uh, the garage building proposed. And the east and the west elevation. The west elevation is the one most closely associated with neighboring residential properties. There's only one window at first floor on this side elevation, and it's proposed that that would be obscure glaze. There's a condition suggested to secure that detail. There is a raised patio area that would access via stairs. Um, that would serve this ground floor. And then obviously, as I say, the, the land continues to slope down. OK, so there's just the site plan again and showing the proposed access here. Um, this There is a small access, a field gate to the further east to what's proposed, and it's that would need to be stopped up. Highways have been consulted. They're happy with the visibility um, and the proposed access and that there's sufficient scope for parking and turning within the site. 
just a reef plan here of the proposed dwelling and the sections drawing showing that raised patio area as the land slopes down towards what would be the swimming pool building sat down into the rear of the garden. So we've got a ground floor and first floor plan. So you can see there's, there's adequate parking and turning within the site, quite generous accommodation. Uh, the swimming pool building, a single storey set down into the site and it is not considered that this would appear a kind of at odds it's quite a kind of appropriate size outbuilding for a plot of that size and there are other outbuildings uh, within the the gardens of dwellings in that vicinity so the key issues are um, whether or not it is an infill opportunity and it's suitable for one dwelling um, as i mentioned it is acknowledged that it is quite a large plot um, there is however a mix of development uh, within the area in terms of size and scale so it's not considered that this would result in any unacceptable harm in terms of the street scene and wider character of the area. The applicant has confirmed a local connection to the parish. Um, size, scale and design, yes, the, the dwelling is larger than those in the immediate area. Um, the, we have got a reduced uh, dwelling. Um, it will marry up in terms of ridge heights and elevation heights and materials, which is a brick and uh, render finish to match the dwellings in the vicinity. A uh, landscape officer has been consulted um, and confirmed that they have no objections. The arrangement of the openings are such that it's not considered there'd be an unacceptable impact in terms of the residential amenity of neighbouring neighboring occupiers. Some concerns have been raised in this regard and with regards to potential overlooking, loss of privacy and the impact on views um, and sunlight, the sunset in the gardens. Um, this is all acknowledged, um, but a right to view isn't, isn't an issue in terms of planning, and it's not considered that the impact in terms of light or loss of privacy would be so significant as to result in harm. Somerset County Highways have, have confirmed no objection. They have recommended a number of conditions which are included within the report. Has been demonstrated that there is sufficient off road parking to meet the needs of the dwelling, and as such, it's not considered that there is any unacceptable impact on highway safety. The application site did originally lie within the catchment for the Somerset Levels and Moors and Ramsar, following an amendment to the mapping uh, recently that, that no longer is the case. The application site now sits outside of that catchment. There are a series of ecology uh, conditions that have been recommended. A number of those are applied and other matters are dealt with by way of informative where that's considered to be more appropriate. Thank you, members. Thank you very much. Uh, I've had a couple of members have indicated to speak. The first was Councillor Hendry and then Councillor Kingham. So we'll start with Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. I, I sometimes wonder why things like this ever have to come before us. I, I understand the parish council objected, but I, I really don't understand this, why they'd object in the first place. The plot of land lends itself to have something built on it. And yes, it's an info, of course it is. The statutory consultees are all on board. The highways have said about the entrance and the gates being pulled back, which is understandable, and I'm sure that will be adhered to. There is, it's not overbearing, it's not overpowering, uh, but the loss of light and it's the same height as everything else. I'm sure the standard of finishing that would be fantastic when it's done. Generally speaking, I can think of nothing negative to say about this whatsoever. I think it's absolutely first class and will look great when it's when it's if it, if it gets past here today, will look fantastic when it's something finished. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. I presume the applicant lives opposite in the blue area. The applicant, uh, the applicant did live opposite. Yes, yeah. um, we are have been advised that they've recently sold that plot um, in order to hopefully fund this development and so they're living in rented accommodation but that doesn't impact the local connection they're still this have been there for a sufficient yeah. period of time I, I think the uh, amended the drawings are probably far better than the first one more in keeping um the the entrance i'm surprised that the highways are happy with that entrance because if the development in wool Hamilton goes ahead then that junction is going to be modified at some stage no, I'm surprised that they haven't got the applicant to make more changes, because if that is changed, then that road junction could be changed quite considerably. Ms. Lowy? Yes, um, thank you. Yes, uh, so the highways, 
did ask for that to be taken into account. So as you can see on the figure drawing there, the proposed roundabout is shown. So that has been taken into account when highways have considered the impact. Um, and they were satisfied that, that the proposed access won't result in an unacceptable harm, even that taking that into account. Um, then I the, the hedge that's currently on the front, is that been kept or has it been replanted or that? Yeah, so the uh, hedgerow there, we will obviously need to see a, a, an area that is lost to provide the visibility. There is a proposed condition in terms of landscaping to ensure that the hedgerows around the remainder of the site are retained and that prior to commencement, a full landscape plan is, is submitted to make sure that that site is appropriately landscaped. It is obviously there on the Polden Ridge there along the A39, so it is important that that detail is secured. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to say I'm not sure if Councillor Henry did it, but uh, I think it's quite a nice scheme and I would like to move the recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Chairman. Um, yeah, I, I think the um, amended plans, I think, are, are very good. I think they, they meet a lot of the concerns that I would have had about this plot, certainly. Um, the only query that I had in the papers was that there was something referring to the Polden Hills landscape area, and that was something new on me. Um, I can't find any reference to it. Is that a thing, or is it? did it used to be a thing? No, so the landscape officer was consulted and asked about that, and they confirmed that it had been an issue that had come up at an appeal previously for a site um, in terms of the importance of that landscape area, which is recognised, but there isn't a specific landscape designation for that area. So the landscape officer's comments confirmed that it's not within a designated landscape, although it's visual prominence within the Polden Hills and the variety and richness of the landscape that is promoted there does make it a high priority area. Thank you for clarifying. And um, I didn't see a comment from Heritage. I'm aware that, that this is a Roman road originally. Is there any concern about heritage or archaeology that we need to be aware of? No, we've not had any any concerns raised. OK, thank you. Uh, did, have you had a seconder for the proposal? Not yet. You have one now. OK, and just to confirm with both Councillor Councillor Kingham, just to confirm, your proposal was including the additional conditions that were outlined by the officers. Thank you. And you're happy with that, Councillor Evans, as well? Thank you. Councillor Scott? Uh, yes, thank you, Jim. <clears throat> Might not be relevant, but um, with building a swimming pool, um, what happens to the um, water once it's changed? Do we have any recourse on what happens to it? Because obviously it's toxic material. Surely. Not that I'm aware of, no, it's not something that I would have thought falls within the remit of planning. Mr. Rees? It would end up um, falling into the management maintenance as a particular household in terms of how they clean, filter and recycle their own water. But that would be the case for any sort of water-based jacuzzi or anything that they put on site. Thank you. Okay. I'm not seeing any other comments or questions. So we have the recommendation to grant permission with the updated conditions Proposed and seconded. Those in favour, please show. That would appear to be unanimous. That's clearly carried, so that is granted. As we mentioned earlier, the other application on the morning's agenda was withdrawn. So if members could turn in their paperwork to, I think it's page 152, and that's the uh, uh, reports starting with the planning appeals received. I think, Mr. Breeze, you're going to take us through these. Confirm that's page 152 of your papers, item 7.1. Thank you. Um, so it's just to covering the additional report. So planning appeals received. Um, we've had an appeal received for erection of a dwelling at Hill House Farm in Brent Road, Burnham on Sea. And we've had a second appeal received for the Bartons at Stockland, Bristol, which was erection of a detached garage tractor store with accommodation in the roof space. Both of those decisions were delegated decisions, so you wouldn't have seen them at committee before now. Thank you. I'm not seeing any comments or questions on those, so if we move to 7.2, which is the appeals decided. 
So appeals decided we've um, had an appeal allowed, which was for installation of a hoarding um, of an internally illuminated sign, uh, which is land south of Rosebury Avenue, but it's near the Cannon Roundabout. If you've seen a big sort of A board, it's around there. So that appeal has been allowed by the planning inspector, um, refused by officers. Um, there was a residential um, extension, single storey front extension with the balcony. Um, it was granted planning permission by officers, but we imposed a condition requiring them to do a privacy screen to the neighbouring um, sort of patio area out the front of the house. The agent didn't like the condition and appealed the condition, um, but the inspector agreed with officers that it was a private area that should have been screened, so that appeal was dismissed. Um, and there was another application that was again dismissed for two-storey and single-storey extension, which was to 28 Clavelshay Road. Um, but again, that was a delegated um, application, so members wouldn't have seen that at committee. Not seeing any comments or questions on those, so we go to 7.3. We've refused one planning permission, um, a certificate of lawfulness for erection of um, an, a dwelling at Mendip View, Rectory Road, Limpsham. So that's them saying that they've erected the dwelling and occupied it as a residential unit in excess of the period of time that they need to demonstrate its lawful use. So we've refused that one. Okay. Um, and 7.4. We've issued a major application, which was Land East of Elport Lane in Highbridge, which is an outline application for 248 dwellings, um, community uses and local shop and public open space. That one was um, did get resolution through committee. Um, a while ago and was held up with Highway England negotiations in terms of the Grampian condition and then the legal agreement and just to throw something else in the balance the developer changed halfway through the application so it took us a while to get that one out but that one's gone. Okay again not seeing anything on that so that brings us to the conclusion of the items on the agenda of this morning so we'll uh, we'll close for this morning and we'll restart again at two o'clock. Please. Um... Can I welcome you all to this afternoon's meeting of the Development Committee? I'm Councillor Filmer, I'm Chairman of the Committee. Um, just again to remind everyone who is joining us online and, and in the room that this meeting is a hybrid meeting uh, in that the committee members are present in the canal side um, and there are other officers and members of the public taking place, taking part through the Teams programme. Um, just to remind you that only councillors who are present within the meeting are able to participate and vote on the applications before us. Uh, could I just ensure that all members and those who are in this meeting can turn their mobile phones to silent or, or off please so that they don't interfere with the meeting and also I would just draw your attention to the fact that the meeting is being recorded. Um, format meeting is as per the agenda that was uh, published uh, and a coffee, coffee, a copy of the officer presentations can be found on the Council's website. We'll take each application in turn. The officers will outline the background and detail of the application. That will then be followed by the public speaking time for those who registered to speak. And uh, once we have heard from the members of the public, we'll then ask members to engage in the debate. Uh, again, members, if you can indicate, obviously we're putting your hand up, but please do wait again, as I mentioned this morning, for the microphone to get to you, because whilst we can hear you in the room, those who are joining us uh, online can't unless you've got the microphone. Uh, also, again, for members, your microphones are permanently uh, on, so you don't need to flick any switches, but they'll be enabled from the back of the room. So uh, just make sure you hold the microphone up so we can see who it is who's is about to speak. Um, during the debate, there'll be a proposal in the second of the resolution. Members will then vote on that proposal. Uh, and again, for those who are joining us on online, only members who have been present throughout the whole of the discussion of that particular item are able to vote. Uh, so if they leave the room for any particular reason, then, then they need to step away from the vote. Uh, the vote will be taken. Members can vote for, against or abstain. Uh, we'll then count the votes and we will announce the result. Just so you know who's, who's with us today, uh, to my right are officers from our legal services section and also from democratic services. To my left, a represent is uh, is our, I was going to say is our planning officers, but there's only one. Um, but we have other planning officers who are joining us online to make their presentations. Uh, and to my left and right, on the wings of the tables, are the councillors who will be debating and then deciding the applications before us. If we uh, move on then to uh, just a couple of housekeeping.
keeping notes. Um, if, if there's anyone who's in the room, if you require toilet facilities, they're through the central door at the, at the rear of the room. Uh, there are drinks to the side uh, of the room if you need it. There's no planned fire drill, so if alarms start going off, then we will show you the safe way out of the room, but it's basically go where the signs are. Um, and I think that's all we need to do in terms of housekeeping updates. So if we move on to our agenda, do we have any apologies for this afternoon's uh, meeting, please? Thank you, Chairman. I've received apologies from Councillor Murphy, um, but Councillor Haywood is not in the building. Oh. And currently, Scott is just going to be joining us later. OK. OK. No problem. Um, next item is urgent items of business. I've not been advised there's any urgent items that aren't on our agenda. Uh, so that is not a problem. So we then move on to public speaking time. Uh, we've got a number of members of the public who registered to speak this afternoon. Uh, again, just to, to make it clear that what we'll, we'll do is we'll take the items uh, when we get to your particular application you'll hear the presentation from the officers will then invite you to come to the table uh, at the front of the, of the room you'll see that there is a, a clock on the front that counts the time down that you've got so it will start at the three minutes and obviously if you can try and draw your comments to a close by that that would be appreciated uh, we are, have at least one speaker who's joining us online so just uh, for them what we will do is we'll give you a one minute verbal warning um, but you've got a minute of the time left to go uh, because I know that once we've got a presentation on the screen, you may not be able to see the clock online. So we will interrupt, but unfortunately, that's the only way we can uh, can do that for you. Right. If we move then on to uh, declarations of interest this afternoon, are there any declarations? We'll start with Councillor Perry. Yes, thank you, Chair. Sure. Yeah, on page 91 and page 142, I'm the ward member for that area and I've took no part in any discussions. OK, Councillor Bolt. I, item 107, a ward member and not taking part in any discussions. Thank you, Councillor Betty. Uh, the um, items on page 91 and 142, I'm the ward member and have took no part in discussions. Thank you. Councillor Facey. Chairman, uh, the member of uh, Burton Hybris Town Council, Chairman, on page 97, I've not taken any uh, part of any discussion relating to that application. Thank you very much. I'm not seeing any further declarations. So for, for members of the public, it's important that you're aware if there's any background that members have on, a, on an application. The, the declarations you've heard uh, this afternoon are all what are called non predetermination declarations. We have a, a standing order within this committee, which is that members can either be involved at the district and can, at district at the parish, sorry, start again, can either be involved at the parish or town level or the district level. Um, they can't do both. The danger is if they're involved at the earlier stage, then they are perceived to have made their mind up on an application and therefore they would not be able to take part in the committee. So where you've heard members declare that they took no part at the town or parish level, that is so that they've been able to retain the ability to be part of this meeting to debate and ultimately vote on the applications before us. That brings us to the end, I think, of the declarations for the moment. So if we move then on to the planning applications themselves, the first application we have, I believe, is on page 91. And I think Ms. Okay. And I will draw your attention to page 136, which is an application which has been withdrawn from the agenda uh, as, as your speaker's list will inform you. The, the parish council withdrew their comments on the, a neutral comment so that it makes the application no longer being dealt with by us as a committee, it's being dealt with as a delegated decision. So if we return then to page 91, um, and Mr. Noon, I think you're joining us online to present this. Yes, yes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can. OK, I'll share my screen. Has that come up? We have the cover sheet. Excellent, thank you. Um, this is an application for a, a sort of steel framed building uh, to be used as a workshop on land just next to the motorway at the rear of newly built house on Horsey Lane. It's known as Appleby. Mm. Uh, members may recall seeing an application there. Um, I think there was a, 
on the back of that house scheme, there was a proposal for the siting of some caravans for some um, workers to build the house. Um, and that one came to committee, I think, about a year and a half ago. So we go to the next slide. Um, we're, on, we're on the old railway line um, that sort of marks the end of development along here. The house Appleby was built at the front of the site on the, on the old railway line opposite a house on the other side of the road. They own the entire plot here, all the length of the old railway line up to the motorway, and the proposal is for a, a shed at the far end. Just zooming in a bit more, this obviously taken prior to the erection of the new house, which is sort of up at the front of the site, sort of roughly in line with the neighbouring bungalow. And then we are sort of about 75, 80 metres down at the far end of the garden for the proposed building. Um, so there's a, the layout plan we have at the front of the site edged in blue. That's the new house access arrangement and garage. There's then an access running down along the north side. Um, the air, the white area in the middle is where the caravans are. Those caravans are due to be removed upon occupation of the house or within, I think it's two years of the original grant of permission. So there is a backstop there. Um, so, and then we are dealing with the site at the very far end edged in red. Just show, zooming in in a bit more detail, you can see here the area in the middle of the site where there are three caravans. There was an issue a little while ago, an additional caravan appeared that has been removed. Um, and then we have a looking at the very back of the plot, just a building uh, 18 metres by 10 metres, that's 18 metres north to south, 10 metres depth on it, it's about 6.3 metres high. Um, so that's going right at the very far end with a good degree of separation between it and the nearest third party, third party property, which is the bungalow just over here to the south of the new house. As the drawings of the building, um, just the roof plan at the top, the middle elevation, there just shows a roller door facing into the site and then we've got sort of um, I think it's brick with um, profile metal sheeting above so a very functional building if it were further out in the countryside it would have an agricultural appearance um, we got a little paddock north and south of the site so it is I think of an appropriate design for this location um, you yeah, know sort of sat at the back of a property in what was originally an old, on what was originally an old railway line with a little paddock either side There's a view stood on the north boundary. Looking into the site where you can see the, 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 the pickup truck parked and then there's the three caravans. They've moved around a bit since I think what we saw originally, um, but it is a permission that allows the use, the temporary siting of, of three caravans in the land. So the exact position of them is, isn't, isn't an issue. Um, they are very close to this little compound, but they are due to go in due course. So there's no amenity issue there. Looking into the site a bit more, got a fence all around the site. Look on the other side of those trees is the motorway. There's a reen in between. There's a fair degree of separation, and the building that is proposed would be on the back fence there, rough, you know, sort of cut from filling the width of the plot where, where where that porter loo is. On the left, you can see a stable block that is to be removed. That's where he is currently keeping his his tools and his building equipment, and it's not secure enough, which is why this building is proposed. And then just swinging the camera around, there's that stable building, which is to go. Um, you can see sort of various items of building equipment. That's what the, the proposed building is for. And then just looking in there, um, again, there's a little bit of sort of straying of domestic stuff, um, but it's essentially, you know, the, the purpose of the building is, is to store this building, the builder's equipment. And then looking back up past the caravans, there is the new house, not yet occupied according to building control records and council tax records. So we don't believe the caravans are there in breach. And then really just coming to the, the key issues in terms of the principle, um, we don't have an objection to people working from home in a variety of ways. 
uh, including sort of builders and you know, tradesmen who might have a shed in the garden where they would keep their equipment more securely than if it was in the van on their drive. Um, so at an appropriate level, this sort of use, subject to tying it to the occupation of the main house, um, is acceptable in principle. Um, as it's an ancillary building to you know to be used as part of the main house where I consider that passes a sequential test in terms of flood risk and then there are raised levels across the site including at the front which is what how the house dealt with its issues so we are at a level where you know the exceptions test is passed making the building safe from the risk of flooding in terms of the impact on the neighbors given the separation from the nearest property which is up next to the main house I do not consider that the building would have any direct impact and the level of use that is likely to occur as someone, you know, essentially their home store for their equipment. I don't think that that is going to generate such activity that it would be an issue in terms of the, the neighbor's living conditions. And then finally, the highways issues, the newly approved access is there to deal with the house and the likely levels of movement that you would expect with a house as an ancillary um, use. Um, you know, we can see the, the types of vehicles likely to be involved, sort of, you know, sort of pick up trucks, transit van size things. Uh, there's no reason to assume that that would be uh, generate a level of traffic that would be incompatible with the access or movements up and down Horsey Lane or the junction with the A39. So on that basis and notwithstanding the concerns that have been raised locally, my recommendation is that the application be approved. Thank you. Thank you very much. As you'll see, we have a speaker on this. Uh, Lyndon Pratt, would you like to come forward again, please? Okay, Mr. Pratt, as you know you've got the three minutes. Start whenever you're ready, please. Chairman and members, the officers have set out the position and in support of the case, this side of the Bramfield site, being the former Somerset and Dorset railway link, with ballast constituent and further hardcore and boarded on the site in the 1990s, when a building was located on the rear boundary. Bramfield use designation is acknowledged. The Horsey area contains a mixed use with frontage residential development and a trade retail warehouse, an outside yard sales area for Mole Valley, adjacent plant and engineering business, warehouse and containers, and abuts up to the M5 motorway with its green border. The building itself will provide buffer screening to the motorway for the plot. The application before you is for the workshop building and stores, which is to be used in conjunction with my client's residential occupation of the site, and that is accepted. The materials of construction and finished site levels are acceptable, with no issues flagged by the officer in connection with either finished materials nor by the Environment Agency in respect of the finished site levels and finished floor area of the building proposed which accord with the flood risk assessment produced. There is no reason to refuse this application, so I'd be grateful if you could endorse the case of his recommendations and grant planning permission. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any comments or questions, please? No, in which case I'm looking yeah, Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, no problem with this whatsoever. Drive up and down the motor anywhere you see this type of building in fields beside the motorway. It doesn't impede on anybody else. Uh, no overshadowing, no noise of any kind. Private drive access and the applicant wants it for a very valid reason. Absolutely no problem at all. If nobody's got anything else to say, I'll move the recommendation to approve. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Betty. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I'm happy to support this after um, just seeing that we have got a rec um, uh, condition about not allowing it to be um, run as a business from down there. I know that a lot of the neighbours down there are worried about it being used as a business. So by seeing that as a condition on there, I'm happy to second the recommendation. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Not seeing anything from... Oh, sorry, Councillor Evans. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, similarly, um, um, I wanted to support this. Um, my only question is, um, we had a, we had a, a comment about the highways being lightly used by the business here. Do we have any condition or control we can put on that to reassure residents, please? Mr. Noon. Um, yeah, I think 
on uh, what condition that I am suggesting to limit it to storage uses. So any kind of prefabricating or any any uh, any other such joinery or anything like that wouldn't fall within the ambit of um, condition number three for storage purposes ancillary to the business run by someone living here. I wouldn't anticipate that would create such levels of movement that there is a problem. So I'm not suggesting that we try to control the vehicle numbers. It's very difficult, difficult to do that. Um, but by defining the use and limiting it in the way I'm suggesting in condition three, uh, my, my view is that that would contain the situation. Councillor Evans. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm, I'm reassured by that explanation and now my name is support. Thank you. Thank you. I've not seen anyone else indicating, so we have a recommendation to grant permission has been both proposed and seconded. All those in support of that recommendation, please show. That's unanimous. Yep. That's unanimous. Yep. Clearly carried. So permission is granted. Right, members, if you turn to the next application, we have speakers present, and that's on page 97. And we move to Burnham and Highbridge. And I think, Ms. Elvey, you're presenting this one. Yes, hello. Thank you, um, Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, um, do you want to just start again, I Amelia? Mean, because we, we didn't, your, your mic wasn't quite running when you first came oh, in. Okay. Can, start can again. Hear me now? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, we can. Okay. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm just getting my presentation ready. Okay, so um, before members is the application on land to the rear of 9 to 11 High Street in Burnham on Sea for the erection of a two storey building to accommodate two flats. The application is before members due to the officer's recommendation being contrary to the view of the Town Council. Um, since the publication of the report, it has been confirmed by County Highways to not include the highway's reason for refusal. Ooh. So this slide lists the policies from the local plan and neighbourhood plan that are relevant to this application. Um, the main considerations for this application are the principle of the development, impacts on visual and residential amenity, highway safety, is highway safety and issues related to flood risk and ecology. The application site is in Burnham-on-Sea Town Centre and is accessed via a track that serves the rear of the properties along the high street. So the application seeks consent for the erection of a two storey, slight L shaped building to accommodate two flats. Each flat will have two bedrooms, a bathroom, kitchen and living room. The building will be accessed via a ramp and stairs to the north elevation. A bin area is located to the west of the property. The proposed building will be gabled with a ridge height of approximately 6.9 metres. The building is proposed to be finished with brickwork and concrete roof tiles. So photo A shows the site is viewed from, a, from the access onto Technical Street to the south of the site. Photo B shows the site is viewed from the north. Photo C shows the garages that are to be demolished and a closer view of the site from the access track. So to, just to confirm, it's that flat brick flat roof um, garage and that rendered gabled um, building which is going to be demolished. Um, photo D shows a Google Street View image of the site. Um, it is a you know a fisheye lens as it were um so it is slightly distorted in that respect but it, it shows a sort of wider view of the um surrounding buildings that are adjacent to the plot so these photos are taken from within the site so photo e is facing towards to the east so the brick wall with the security alarm um is the rear of the brick flat roof garage that you can see in the other pictures um, photo F shows the adjacent property to the northwest. Photo G is facing southwest, showing um, neighbouring properties. Um, the window to the right, so this window here, oh, sorry, that window there, <laughs> um, serves a flat, and this window here is for a holiday apartment. Um, and photo H is facing towards the west, showing that um, just a closer view of the neighbouring property. Okay, so the principle of the development is considered acceptable as the site is within the development boundary and unlikely to undermine the retail function of the town centre. Many of the proposed elevations will either be entirely blank or have limited window detailing. Combined with the restricted nature of the plot, this is considered to result in an unacceptably over-dominant development. 
Furthermore, due to the constricted plot, it is not considered for there to be adequate amenity space for occupiers of the flat and the bin storage area does not comply with um, Somerset Waste Partnership's guidance. The application site is surrounded by residential properties, Belmont House, 1.5 metres to the south, approximately. Um, first floor flats, approximately four metres to the west and Potter's Mews, approximately 4.8 metres to the east. This proximity of the building combi combined with the height and design of the building is considered to be unacceptable in respects of impacts relating to overshadowing and loss of light and over dominance. In terms of overlooking, relevant windows could be conditioned to be obscure glazed and this is there not, therefore not considered to be an issue despite the proximity of the other properties. In respect of amenities of future occupants of the proposed flats, the properties will meet national space standards and have adequate natural light to all habitable rooms. The Highways Authority consider the proposal to be acceptable due to the town centre location. The site is in Flood Zone 3, however, both the sequential and exception tests are considered passed as the site is within the development boundary and has two storeys. A preliminary roofs assessment has been, consent, has been um, carried out on the site and the county ecologists have suggested relevant biodiversity enhancement measures that could be included if consent were to be granted. Um, it should be noted that there have been negotiations between the officer and um, the applicant and the agent to try and um, create a more supportable proposal. However, these have been unsuccessful. Um, so for the reasons I've outlined, the application is recommended for refusal for two reasons um, relating to conflict with policies D2 and D25 of the local plan and policy H1 of the neighbourhood plan. The first reason is due to the proximity to neighbouring residential properties and the overdominance and overshadowing of neighbouring dwellings that would result from this. And the second reason is that due to the proposed building size, scale and layout, there would be an unacceptable visual impact on the street scene and an overdevelopment of a restricted plot with inadequate refuse storage. So um, just for completeness sakes, I've got um, full views of the drawings here. So this is the location plan. This is the block plan, the route proposed roof plan, and the proposed floor plans, elevations and section. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, we have a speaker on this application. Uh, Steve Scott, would you like to come forward? Again, just to remind you, you've got three minutes to address the committee and you'll see the time countdown on the clock. So start when you're ready, please. Thank you, Chairman. Unfortunately, I must express my frustration with the way my application has been dealt with. My application was submitted last September. We were told to provide ecological appraisal that there was insufficient space for bins and to revisit the parking. And concerns were made about the separation between the existing property and the west elevation. No other issues were raised. An ecological appraisal was done, bin storage was addressed, uh, we believed, and parking changed. We submitted our new plan in December. Our revised plan was not picked up by the planning officer until three weeks ago after we pointed it out. Even then they said nothing about parking, nothing about overlooking. Over the past few months we've submitted sketches, reducing the size of the first floor to come further away from the window to the west elevation. They simply said this was not enough of a change. We suggested a condition requiring us to use obscure glass and possibly enlarging the second window in the room facing the west elevation. We were told that they could not put a condition on anything outside of the red line. They did not mention a Grampian condition could be used as I own that building, but, if, but yet again, out of hand, dismissed the suggestion. We requested a site meeting. They refused. We submitted further drawings. Each time the feedback was negative, unhelpful, and gave us no firm direction to go in other than to design a coach house style building. We did a coach house style sketch. They did not like it. No planning reasons, no constructive comments, nothing said about parking, nothing about overlooking neighbours, which would have been worse than our original plan. I feel that I have no option but to stick to the amended version of the original plans and take it to you, the committee. Now, for the first time, nearby flats at the Potter's Mews are being cited and overlooked, as being overlooked, although all the windows facing these properties are of obscure glass. Nothing had been mentioned before. Once again, the goalposts have been moved. 
Now officers suggest that two parking spaces are not enough. The advice from the independent highway consultant is that this location, there is no parking requirements whatsoever. Officers say we're losing parking spaces from the existing garages. This is not correct. The town council right. It is a well-designed property and incorporates off-road parking where previously garages had been used for storage only. I would urge members of the committee to ask for a site visit so minimal impact of the proposal can be seen. You will see that my proposal is not an overdevelopment of a highly sustainable brownfield at town centre site. The town council also say there is a need for small residential properties and helps the sustainability of the town. It would improve the visual amenity of the area and street scene and Belmont House, by the way, our holiday flats, not residential. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much and well done. But before I come to members, uh, Ms. Elvey, is there anything you wanted to come back? And I think also I've got uh, Mr. Noon indicating that he wants to comment. Um, yeah, thank you, Chairman. I would just like to clarify that, um, you know, it has been raised about the proximity to res other residential properties, you know, and not just specifically the flat at 9 to 11 um, High Street. Um, yes, there were some re revised drawings, um, sketches made, and we didn't think that there was enough of a change. And we suggested the changes, um, for instance, a coach house, as um, the speaker mentioned. So, uh, you know, we have we have tried to negotiate that. The, the plan that um, you refer to that I only saw three weeks ago. I actually did initially see it l longer ago than that. It got misfiled. I hadn't put it on the um, application, but I had seen it. Um, as previously raised, the Highways Authority are now happy about the parking. So that's kind of, you know, not a not an issue now in terms of the reasons for refusal. Um, I, I think that's about it, really. I can't think of um, anything okay. else to add. Thank you. Uh, Mr Noon? Yes, I just wanted to... Um because that was my understanding. Reason number three is to be dropped in light of the comments of the Highways Authority. Is that correct, Millie? Yes, that is, Adrian. Yeah. Right. And then just so that leaves us with the two just reasons one and two as, as, as our suggested reasons for refusal. Um, that's not saying um, it's overlooking. It, it's really the dominance and overshadowing. So it's not the windows issue because as as was pointed out, it's you know, we could use a condition to require obscure glazing. It's just the sh the proximity and the bulk of the building right on top of third parties, albeit in holiday let use, but that's still a residential use that deserves consideration. And then obviously there's the level of development and the overall impact. So those are the two reasons for refusal that are left on the table. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Hendry, you indicated. Thank you, Mr Chairman. During this whole debate, that well, this conversation has been going on, I haven't heard the word fire escape been used once. When you have a property like this, where it's two individual flats, one on top of the other, it shouldn't, shouldn't there be a provision of some kind for a fire escape? And if there's not a fire escape, at very, very least, there should be fire escape windows. That's without anything else, just fire escape. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think I'm right in saying that that would be addressed by building regs. Yes, it would. And the um, fire service have um, confirmed that, that that's a building regulation issue rather than um, something to be dealt with at this stage. OK. Any other comments or questions from members, please? I'm not seeing any anything. In which case I'm going to be looking for a yes, Councillor King, you're indicating. No, you're still... Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Um... I think obviously what Councillor Hendry said was probably a, a building regs problem, which is uh, fire escape windows. But uh, I'd like to um, move the recommendation amongst conditions. That's with the, and with the deletion of the third issue that was the the parking. Uh, can I just also double check? Is this the first application on this site? Yes, is it way? is. Yeah. So so were there to be a refusal on those grounds, then there would be the ability to, for a in effect, the, the free go for further negotiations? Correct, yeah. OK. Um, any, Councillor Hendry? Thank you. I'm quite happy to second Councillor Stuart Kingham for the same reasons. Thank you. OK. 
So we have, I'm not seeing any further indications from any other members. So we have a recommendation for refusal based on the first two reasons. Those in favour of that, please show. One, And those against, please show. And any abstentions? One abstention. Okay, so that is clearly carried. I would say that obviously from the discussions we've had today, there, there seems to be some room for further discussion. Um, so if there can be a, a further liaison with the case officer, I think that would be a starting point. And, and we'll obviously have a look at that as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Members, that moves us to our next application with a speaker, which is on page 107, which moves us to Cannington. And Ms Parsons, I think you're presenting this one. Yes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a planning application for the erection of a new agricultural workers dwelling on land at the granary at Blackmore Lane in Cannington. And the site area is here to the southwest of Cannington, and you can see the Cannington bypass and the A39 along here that leads to Nether Stowey. The site is located um, approximately in this location here and comprises a well established farm known as Blackmore Farm. This site shows the site location in respect of the existing agricultural buildings immediately adjacent and um, the existing tied farm building known as the granary here. Um, the holding also includes two other residential properties, one known as the courtyard in this location, the other one known as the shire here, and it also includes a farm shop here. The existing agricultural enterprise is run as a family business by the applicant and his two daughters. This shows the application site to the east adjacent to the existing tide dwelling. This is the applicant's dwelling known as the granary, which was granted consent approximately well, in 2010. Um, adjacent to the west are, are some of the agricultural buildings associated with the farm. Immediately to the north again it are the two dwellings known as the courtyard and the shire which are occupied by the applicant's two daughters who work on the farm. The um, Blackmore Farm listed building, which is located here, together with the associated holiday units, are um, separate to the farm holding and are owned by Councillor Mr Dyer. This is showing the red outline for the application site area with associated farmland outlined in blue. So the proposal, proposal is to erect a detached four bed agricultural workers dwelling located here, occupying, sorry, utilizing an existing vehicular access, which also serves the granary. I'll run through some photographs of the site. Um, this is the existing access into the site and you can see the site area for the new dwelling is beyond the post and rail fencing here. And this is looking eastwards along Blackmore Lane with the siting beyond the post and rail fencing. This is looking in the opposite direction. The existing access into the site here, which would which is proposed to serve the new dwelling and the farm buildings beyond. This is looking directly into the site behind the post and rail fencing. The granary can be seen beyond. Another um, photograph of the site access. This is uh, the entrance further along Blackmore Lane, which serves the Shire, the courtyard the farm shop and Blackmore Farm House and associated holiday accommodation. And that's a closer view of the Shire. Uh, these photographs show the Shire facing into the courtyard, which is opposite the listed farmhouse. This is the proposal, um, the erection of four bed house. The ground floor level, you've got um, a dining room, kitchen with a utility WC, a lounge 
a farm office and another utility with an attached double garage and at first floor le level four double double bedrooms together with an ensuite and a family bathroom. I'll just go back to the aerial. Now in terms of the principle of residential development, the site, as I said, is outside of any settlement boundary and therefore in a countryside location. And planning policy seeks to protect the countryside and therefore in such, a in such countryside locations, new development is strictly controlled and only permissible in exceptional circumstances. Um, policy CO1 is clear that there must be a specific countryside need. Now, policy D10 within the local plan supports agricultural worker dwellings, um, provided it's clearly in connection with an established farming enterprise. But um, it is subject to a list of criteria, which is listed in the agenda item for this application under principle of development. And I'm going to just run through the criteria. The dwelling is required to satisfy a clearly established existing functional need to live at or near their place of work in the countryside that cannot be met within defined settlement boundaries. And the rural business has been established for at least three years, has been profitable for at least one of them, is financially sound and has a clear prospect of remaining so. And the functional need could not be fulfilled by an existing suitable and available dwelling either on the unit or in the area and the dwelling need not be fulfilled could sorry the dwelling could not be fulfilled by another existing building capable of conversion on the unit or any other building capable of conversion in the area and the proposal is well related in relation to the rural business reflecting its functional need and wherever possible is sited within a hamlet or existing group of buildings and finally, the dwelling should be of a size commensurate with the essential need and should be able to be supported long term by the rural enterprise. Now, for a new dwelling to be supported, the rural business in question must, amongst other things, have an essential functional need for a full time worker to reside on the site for most of the day and night, most of the year. In terms of labour and management of the business, there are three full-time family members involved in the day-to-day -day running of the business. The applicant is mainly involved in the arable side and assists with the livestock when necessary and lives at the granary. One daughter is responsible for calf rearing and lives at the courtyard. The other daughter is responsible for the cattle and also the farm administration and lives at the shire. In addition, there is a part time worker who is principally employed as a tractor driver. Now, the applicants propose to dispose of the shire along with the farm shop. This application seeks to provide a new dwelling to be occupied by an agricultural worker. However, it's considered that this misses a fundamental issue here, namely that there is already a dwelling on the site, the shire that meets the needs of this particular worker and there are two other dwellings that meets the need needs of the holding as a whole. As the holdings functional needs are currently served by three dwellings, one of them of which is agriculturally tied. If one of these houses is disposed of, it is considered that there it is considered that the remaining two dwellings would continue to meet the functional needs of the site. No compelling evidence has been provided why a new dwelling to replace the one to be sold and further away from the working site would be needed to meet the functional agricultural needs of the holding. In terms of financial justification, while the financial status of the enterprise is not disputed, the functional need is not met and therefore it's not considered that the principle of an agricultural worker's dwelling meets the exceptions criteria. In terms of ecology, the ecologist states that the site may well be suitable for reptiles, raises concern regarding the amount of light that could be emitted from the development due to the significant number of windows proposed. Therefore, the ecologist requires an ecological assessment, and it's essential that the presence or otherwise of protected species and the extent that they may be affected by the development is established. 
before the planning permission is granted. And therefore, as no such report has been provided to demonstrate that the development will cause no harm to protected species, the proposal is contrary to policy D20 of the local plan. In terms of highway safety, it's considered that the access is appropriate and there would be adequate parking off road to serve the proposed dwelling. In terms of residential amenity, the proposed dwelling would be sited in such a way as to not cause undue harm in terms of overlooking loss of light or visual dom domination to the nearest dwelling to it, which would be the type dwelling at the granary. And in terms of visual, visual amenity, the proposed dwelling would be of an appropriate scale, form and design. And if the principle of the erection of a dwelling in this location were to be acceptable as an exception, it's considered the development would have no adverse impact on the character, character of the area. Now to conclude, the, it is not considered that it has been clearly demonstrated that there is a functional need for an additional dwelling on the site of this agricultural enterprise. Furthermore, in the absence of an ecological assessment, it has not been demonstrated that there would be no adverse impact on protected species. Therefore, the recommendation is to refuse consent for the two reasons in the report. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Again, we have a, a speaker with us who I believe is joining us on Teams. Uh, James Wilding, if you could enable your microphone and just we can check that it's working. Thank you, Chairman. Can you hear me? Oh, just about. Um, if, if could, could you just try again, see if you'll be a little closer to the mic? Can you hear me OK? Yeah, I think I think that's OK. So uh, just to remind you, you've got three minutes. I will interrupt you when there's one minute of that time left to go just to just to give you a warning. So uh, please start when you're ready. Thank you very much. Uh, this application relates to the provision of a replacement dwelling with the existing accommodation along with adjacent farm shop to be sold to enable the family farming business to focus on agricultural production. The Shire currently provides accommodation for the applicant and one of the daughters, as we've heard. Um, and however, once this is sold, this will no longer be available to her. And whilst this may seem premature to apply whilst the accommodation is still available, she wants to plan ahead and not find herself potentially homeless as a result of the disposal. This explains the logic behind the application. This is a very sizable family farming business and operated over two holdings. At Blackmore Farm, there are around 800 cattle at any one time from a few days old to 18 months of age. This is a substantial number to manage. The scale of the enterprise is highlighted by the labour calculation using standard data, which confirms a need for over three full-time labour units for the cattle alone. This is a 24 hours a day, 365 days a year operation. And unlike paid labour that are contracted to work a 40 hour working week, be legally required to take a minimum of 20 days holiday a year and entitled to sick leave, it is very different for these family members and partners in the business. They keep working seven days a week. Without such cover, the welfare of the cattle and the proper functioning of the business will be severely affected. In terms of the long term continuation of the farming business, succession is important. And in this case, there is the potential for Alan Dyer to retire in the next five to 10 years. And as noted in case law, it would be totally unreasonable for him to have to vacate his dwelling and locate off the holding in order to release a dwelling for one of the other partners. Retirement, however, is not a consideration at this point in time. There has been much debate with officers with regard to the siting of the proposed uh, dwelling. And with the farm shop complex and the third party ownership to the north and west, siting close to the Shire. And you have one minute to go. One minute to go. Thank you. Hence why the most recent dwelling built nine years ago was sited to the east of the farmyard and buildings adjacent to the site we are proposing. This location provides easy access to key livestock buildings and does not conflict with the farm shop area. Objection has been raised regarding the lack of a habitat survey. As part of the planning application, a wildlife trigger list was completed as the application site was less than 0.1 hectares and did not involve the demolition of an existing building. The application was registered by the local planning authority on the basis that both national and local validation checklists had been met. A survey was not considered necessary at the time. 
The provision of a wildlife survey could be conditional. We're happy to get one done. However, we'd like to add that the development will utilise an existing field gate entrance, as mentioned. No useful boundary hedgerows will be affected. Thank you, Mr. Malik. I will, uh, sorry, I'll have to call time on you there. But I'm just, thank I'm you. just finishing. I'm just finishing. Thank you very much. It is considered to be of low grade habitat value. Thank you for allowing us the opportunity thank to you. speak. I hope it's worked on Zoom Numbers. and we respectfully request the application is supported. Thank you. Start with Councillor Kingham and then Councillor Evans. Um, it seems to have a, a strange uh, application where they have existing properties which these people are living in, which they're going to sell and construct a new one. So I think the offer has got the recommendation right. Thank you, Councillor Evans. Not, not, okay. not these. <laughs> <way yet. laughs> In, in, in which case, I'll just I'll, I'll, I'll just add to that. I, I, I've looked at policy D10. See, clearly, this does not meet the sequential test there. Um, I think this this is a no-brainer. I think, um, and I'd like to propose the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Anybody else? Councillor Kingham. Yeah, I'll second it, Chairman. Okay. okay. If there's no further comments or questions from members. I'm not seeing any, so we have the recommendation, which is the uh, the officer's recommendation for refusal has been moved and seconded. All those in favour of that recommendation, please show. No, it's not. Okay, any Sorry. against? And any abstentions? Thank you. So that is, is clearly carried, so permission is, is refused. That's the last of the applications we have for speakers present. Do members want to take a short comfort break at this point or to carry on? I think, um, so we carry on then? Okay, right members, if you move then to page 116, which is our next application, uh, we move to Cheddar. And is this Mr. Newman? Ah, and it's Mr. DeVries. You get my pleasure once again for the day. Um, right, this application's just an application for a single story detached garage. It's before planning committee because the applicant is a, mem a senior member of staff. So in line with our protocol, we can't um, determine those under delegated powers. So it's clear um, and open transparency. Um, there's no objection from the parish council or any resident. So this just shows um, the location of the site. And this shows the application site outlined in red. We've not got it on screen at oh. the moment. Who? Okay. <laughs> just bear with us one minute, we'll get the... Bear with me. This should do it. We've got the Sedgemore logo on now. And we've got the cover sheet. Yep. Done. Right. Okay, I'll start again. Apologies. Um, so it's a senior member of staff, which is why it's before committee. There's no objection from the parish council or any residents. So this is just an aerial um, sort of shot of it. It's off of the little cul-de-sac, um, Springfield Close. So it's just in this location here. And this shows the application site sort of zoomed further in. So Springfield Close goes up here. There's a little turning head. It's the property set back in this location. The neighbouring property is set forward with a detached garage forward of this one. It requires planning permission because the garage is forward of the principal elevation. Okay, so in terms of footprint, um, the proposed garage is shown on this plan. It's set back from the neighbouring garage. And it's a single garage, but it's got a footprint on the inside that's large enough to take a car. So there's a requirement for three parking spaces. There would be a retention of spaces for three parking spaces. So space with inside the garage and another two either side. And it's a fairly modest single storey garage. So in terms of some site photos, so this is the neighbouring um, property to the front here and the application sites just around the turning head here. And again, this is the um, application site set back here. 
And again, in this location here, so you can see a couple of cars parked here. This is the application property. So it's proposed to put a double garage, um, single garage, sorry, in this location. And again, this is the neighbouring garage that would have been seen. So a single garage roughly in this location here. So in terms of key issues, whilst the garage is forward of the principal elevation of the property, it's single storey in height and ad adjacent to the neighbouring garage and setback. So in terms of street scene, officers aren't raising any particular issues with it. Um, the garage is to be built in matching materials to neighbouring properties, so we consider it to be acceptable within the street scene. It would have minimum visual impact on the character and appearance, being a relatively low key single storey building. Um, and there are bio enhancements um, provided through conditions for a sparrow nesting box no local objection, and the application has been recommended for approval. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Hendrick indicated. OK, uh, absolutely no problem whatsoever with this. The situation can lend itself to being sympathetic to that time uh, of building that erection. Absolutely agree. Yeah. I'd like to propose the uh, officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Facey. Thank you, Councillor Hendry. Uh, I'd like to second that proposition, Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not seeing any further comments from members. So the recommendation has been moved and seconded to grant permission. Those in support, please show. <laughs> Thank you. Right, members, if you again turn to the next application before us, which is on page 121, uh, Wedmore, and I think, Mr Lloyd, you're joining us virtually. I am, Chairman. Hopefully you can see me. We can. And shortly, hopefully, you'll see my presentation. Why are we going twice at the moment? Still launching over there. Okay. Right. Are you seeing that, Chairman? Not yet. We can see you and we can see the room, but we, ah. <laughs> we can't see the presentation. <laughs> Try and swap that around. Right, try again. Uh, yep, yep we're, looking, we're getting there. That was the wrong one. Yeah, we've got your presentation, but on the um, not on the full screen yet. Oh, okay. Did your new slideshow? Just see. That's it, we're there. Happy days. Um, good afternoon, Chairman members. Um, this is an application at the Swan Hotel in Wedmore. Um, the description of development is the change of use of function room to form four guest bedroom suites. And I'll, I'll say a little bit more about, about the use and the, the description of development as I go through the presentation, because it's quite an important consideration. Um, the application is before members um, as the officer recommendation is contrary to the view of Wedmore Parish Council. Uh, the parish objections are on the grounds that the closure of the function room would mean the loss of a valuable community asset uh, and the provision of uh, four more bedrooms would result in even more parked cars in the already congested village main street. Um, a similar objection on the use grounds has also been received um, from the Isle of Wedmore Society. And I'll say a little bit more about that further on. In terms of updates, um, as I said just now, um, the development would be more accurately, accurately described as alterations to the function room to for, form the guest bedroom suites for the purposes of, of the consideration of the application and the decision. Um, because um, through an assessment of the application, we have to look at what constitutes the planning unit. Um, the planning unit is effectively the public house and changes within that, um, that planning unit can happen without requiring planning permission. So, for example, historically, um, this building is <coughs> used as, um, as a skittle alley and it changed from a skittle alley um, to the function suite, but without involve in a change of use of the planning unit and so that that, that same principle applies here now it's a, it's a matter of fact and degree but most of the accommodation remains as as 
a public house and this is ancil ancillary and incidental to that public house use so it doesn't involve a change of use and therefore importantly it doesn't involve the loss of of, of a community asset but i will say a little bit more about that as the as the presentation proceeds um, and one other important thing to note is um, that the report does address but not specifically re refer to the council's public sector equality duty under the equality act of 2010 now that requires public bodies to have due regards to the um, the need to eliminate discrimination uh, advance equality of opportunity and foster good relations between different people when carrying out their activities so it's implicit in the report and the conclusions that the council as local planning authority has considered this issue we don't consider any group to be prejudiced by the proposed operational development requiring permission that is the physical external works um, and therefore there's no uh, no concerns with, with regard to the public sector equality duty. Turning to the main considerations, um, there's the principle of the change from the current use as function room, uh, ancillary and incidental to the law for use as a public house to the four guest bedroom uh, ensuite bedrooms. There's the effect of the proposed development on the character and appearance of the area, including the setting of the nearby conservation area. There's the implications uh, for highway safety, including parking, uh, as referred to, and the parish concerns. Uh, I'll talk very briefly about phosphate and ecology issues uh, and also impacts on the immunity of neighbouring residents. So that's a list of the key local plan policies from the report. This is um, the local plan inset map of Wedmore and the site is marked by this blue dot to the northwest of D18, which is the retail designation in, um, in Wedmore. So the site is just outside of that retail designation. This is the boundary of the conservation area, which effectively shows um, that the pub itself is within so the, the, the sort of uh, mauve hatched area is conservation area. This is the outbuilding, uh, the subject of the application with the blue star on it, and that's outside of the conservation area, but in theory, elevational changes to it could affect the setting of the conservation area. So the conservation officer has been involved in the application and those discussions. This is just the inset map from the application uh, agenda. Again, this is just the location map, uh, the location plan showing the, uh, the the red line, effectively the, the the pub and its beer garden, uh, and that's in blue. And then a block plan. So, turning to the detail, you've got the Swan. If pe if 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 members know it, you you drive under an arch into this rear area, which is a car park. I've got some photographs I'll show you shortly. This is the uh, the building in question. You can see that it's it's linked physically by a sort of walkway through to the pub, uh, so you don't get wet when you, you go to the function room or you wouldn't go into the bedrooms. And then one side of it faces the car park, the other side of it faces the pub beer garden. So this is the, uh, the internal layout as it is, uh, as a function suite uh, with a sort of short patio outside that's how it looks at the moment so the blank elevation is the elevation onto the car park and the elevation with windows and doors faces the beer garden this is an aerial view um, so this is the pub drive underneath to the car park this is the building and the beer garden that's just a closer and clearer view which shows that uh, that's a sort of historical view, which shows that it's been, the building's been there for quite some time. This is the plan of the guest bedrooms, effectively showing that um, there's four individual rooms uh, accessed from the beer garden side through some new double doors uh, and with en suites to the rear. This is the proposed elevation. Um, there's been some changes to that as a result of discussions with the conservation officer. In effect, there was some uh, vertical boarding. Um, I think it was black painted. And what we've got through negotiation is some horizontal boarding um, in, in sort of natural timber, which will uh, weather naturally, which is more, um, uh, more respectful to um, traditional 
uh, local materials and character within the conservation area. This is a detail showing the type of conservation roof lights that would be proposed um, to give additional light into the guest bedrooms. And then photographs of the site. Um, so this is it, that's the archway on the right there that I was uh, referring to that the vehicles pass through. This is a Google Street view. So as, as Millie, has, Millie said in her earlier presentation, um, it's a, uh, it gives you a panoramic view at an elevated position because the camera's on top of a vehicle. Uh, and for that reason, it's, it, it provides a good perspective, but it's not an eye level perspective. This is a, the view of the building uh, within the car park. Um, you can see that it's actually it's mainly block work, which has been white white painted rendered with a clay tar roof. And this is it from the beer garden side. So this is the building on the left. You can see the link, um, which is the, the, the stone faced in front of the trees, and that links through into the pub itself. And again, just a view back from uh, the other side of the beer garden back towards the building in question. That's just a close up of, of it as it is at the moment as it as a function suite. So in terms of um, summarizing and conclusions, um, the principle of development um, surrounds um, whether the reuse and repurposing of the existing function room to four guest bedroom suites involves a change of use requiring plan and permission. Um, policy D35 seeks to preserve local uh, value local services as does policy WD13 of the Wedmore Neighbourhood Plan. However, as I said, the planning unit is the public house itself. The change from function room to guest bedrooms is ancillary with and incidental to that use as a public house and doesn't require separate planning permission. Uh, all of the accommodation remains in use as part of the public house business and therefore uh, there's no loss of a local service. Um, the owner is considered best placed to make the commercial decisions to support the continued use of the business, particularly at such a time when so many public houses are closing or under threat. This development will assist the commercial viability of the premises. Um, the other main impact is the effect on the character and appearance. And as you've seen in the plans and the photographs, that's been adjusted and, uh, and amended to the satisfaction of the conservation officer with the uh, or with a horizontal cladding which respects local traditions. Um, there's no change in parking and, and the way that that functions. Um, and despite the parish concerns, officers don't consider that the change from guest bedrooms would have a detrimental impact on parking. The function suite can accommodate up to 100 people at any one time. So you, at any one particular time, you can have a lot more cars um, attending as a result of a of a function than you would as um, as four separate bedrooms. Um, there's no phosphates or ecology concerns. Um, some detailed photographs have been supplied to the ecologist and they've had a good look and they're satisfied. And um, guest accommodation is unlikely to increase impact on the immunity of neighboring residents compared to the potential disruption that could be uh, Cause through um, you know through functions attended by up to 100 people. Um, that concludes the presentation, Chairman. We're recommending approval. I'd be happy to answer any questions that members have. Thank you. Thank you very much. I've got a couple of members who've already indicated. That's Councillors Kingham and Hendry. So we'll start with Councillor Kingham. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I know there's another premises. I know there's Skip Lally. Thank you, former. Uh, but. Um, Trying to get around the objections from the parish council, um, as the officer said, this will not actually take away any parking spaces. We've got 16 allocated there. I mean, so if, if guests come there, they will be obviously asked to park within those parking spaces. And I'm sure that uh, the loss of the function room won't be missed because obviously the fact that it's not being used is why he wants to convert it. And also it's bringing people into the village to spend their money on local facilities. So uh, I would like to recommend the <coughs> proposal. You're moving the recommendation. OK, thank you. Uh, Councillor Hendry. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Excuse me. 
I sympathise with this this type of people who own this one hotel because we've had this applications before, and I I, I even have one myself similar. <coughs> you cannot expect a pub or a guest house or a hotel to remain in perpetuity just because it it, it maybe almost suits a few of the locals who see it as a, a loss to their community. They're not paying the outgoings for these places. The people who own the Swan have obviously done their sums and figures and realised that it would be much more profitable to make it four guest bedrooms, have it that way as opposed to a function suite, which is maybe sometimes used by locals, whatever the case is. You cannot expect these people to carry on like that. That's not how they want to do it. If, by way of example, you had a chemist or something like that, that was in central Redmore that closed, you wouldn't have all the locals up in arms about that and saying it's a loss to the community. It doesn't happen that way. This has to be allowed to go through exactly as it is with the officer's recommendation. I'm happy to, uh, to second Councillor Stuart Kingham. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? I'm not seeing anything at the moment. No, in which case we've had the recommendation moved and seconded to uh, grant permission as outlined in the report. Those in favour, please show. Excuse me, Chairman. Can, can, oh, hold on. Can, can Sorry. I just, can I just clarify? So I, I do apologise. Tim, can I just clarify um, that in terms of the description of development, rather than um, the decision being issued on the change of use of a function room, it would be alterations to function room to okay. form the guest bedrooms. Just clarify that as, as per the update slide. OK. Thank so you. Just in, you Councillor Kingham, you're happy with the amended that, wording? Yeah. Absolutely, Chairman. And Councillor Henry, OK. And Lee? Okay, we've got that minuted. That's fine. Okay, members, those in favour of the amended description and the proposition, please show. That's clearly carried. And if you can turn to page 142 and Western Zoiland and Mr Lloyd, I think we're with you again. Okay. Thank you, Chairman. I'll just get my next presentation up. Yep, we've got the cover sheet now. Thank you very much. Um, so this is um, a property uh, at, it's called Shillingsbury on Church Lane in Western Zoyland, um, in the centre of the village. Uh, the proposal is a change of use uh, of a workshop and the reintroduction of the first floor to form a residential annex, which includes uh, a flank gable, velox and light well windows and the description of development has been re revised during the course of consideration. Um, the application is before members as the officer's recommendation is contrary to the view of Western Zoyland Parish Council. The parish objections are on the grounds that the roof velox windows are of a height which could cause overlooking of neighbouring church farm cottage and on the lack of parking resulting in increased pressure on street in the main road. Um, the parish objections, particularly on parking grounds, um, were re reiterated by the parish in response to the reconsultation. Uh, no other objections have been received and one letter of support from uh, from a neighbour has been received. Uh, I have two updates. There's one uh, on the sheet there. The county ecologist has confirmed uh, no comments to make. Um, I've got one further verbal update, uh, which is um, I did ask um, Somerset County Highways to revisit the application in view of the parish concerns, but they've reiterated that standing advice applies, which they generally say when it's a small scale application uh, of no sort of serious highway consequences. 
So the main considerations are the principle of development within the settlement boundary. Um, it's the reuse and refurbishment uh, of a long existing building of traditional construction within the centre of Western Zoiland. The, bu the building, as members will see from the photo shortly, uh, is in really poor condition. Uh, the roof was so bad it's been removed uh, and the proposal involves a reinstatement of that. Um, we've got the heritage considerations which surround um, any implications for the setting of nearby listed buildings. That's notably great to Shillingsbury itself, which is the cottage. Um, as I'll explain, the, the application site was within the former farm uh, next door and within the ownership of the cottage next door. And it's been sold and in reincorporated, in, sorry, incorporated within uh, the curtilage of Shillingsbury. And then we've also got the, uh, the grade one listed church to the south. Uh, we've got the parking and highways considerations, as I said, and then also uh, any neighbouring amenity considerations. So these are the local plan policies from the report and the uh, the map, inset map of Western Zoiland. So we're right in the centre, the, the little red dot is the application building. Uh, we're right in the centre of, uh, of the historic part of Western Zoiland. That's the, uh, the plan from the agenda and the location plan from the application. So if, if I just zoom in on that with a block plan, um, anyone who knows Western Zoiland, this is the main street to the south. Church Lane basically runs in an inverted U around the church. It, it's a sort of, it's a narrow traditional rural lane. At the head of it, we've got um, Shillingsbury itself, which is a small, um, what looks to be a sort of two up, two down um, listed cottage. Um, it's got quite a long uh, rear north facing garden with a number of uh, original and new outbuildings, uh, which the applicant has been in the process of um, of refurbishing recently. Um, this is the application building here, the former workshop, which was formerly part of a farm uh, and was sold to the applicant by um, the owners of um, of Church House Cottage here uh, to the west, along with a little strip of land uh, to allow for um, access and maintenance to it. So now that's incorporated within um, the curtilage of, Sh of Shillingsbury. So these are the existing um, elevations. Uh, this is just uh, an outbuilding, um, but this is the main building. You can see the footprint of it here, uh, and you can see that it's got no roof on. This is uh, an aerial view. So the large blue rectangle shows the location of the church. The blue circle is uh, Shillingsbury itself, and then the smaller blue rectangle uh, is the position of the workshop in question. That's just another aerial view, uh, historic, um, when there was a few more trees around the site. Uh, that's a bit of a clearer view, which shows that the building originally had these sort of hip bonnets and they're to be reinstated. So there's the proposed uh, uh, plans and elevations. So it's effectively uh, an L shape that's sort of taken out this, this corner, uh, reinstating the roof and uh, incorporating some Velux windows. I think a uh, key thing here to note from members is how low down the Velux windows are. Um, so in that north elevation, uh, this uh, elevation here, you can see that they're very low because they serve this stairwell. Um, Mr Lloyd, if I could just let you know, I, I, I don't know whether you're pointing at your cursor, but sir, I don't have the cursor on my oh. plan. I don't know whether anyone else is seeing it. So if you can do it by description, that's good. But it's now there. It's material. Okay, I, 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 I do apologise. I've, I've been I've been putting it on my second screen, so I'll, I'll <laughs> use I'll use it on the primary screen. So okay. you, you, you can see that the Velux windows are set very low because they, they serve a stairwell on one side. Uh, on the south side uh, and also um, they're slightly higher on the north side, but there's a good separation distance there. So this is a, a, a Google Street View image, you know, elevated and panoramic. So you can see um, Shillingsbury to the left. Um, this, all of this land to the side belongs to this cottage to the left, 
along with um, this garage and this gate. And um, Shillingsbury has a pedestrian access um, uh, right of way through this gate um, and into its garden. These are the traditional outbuildings that are referred to. So it's only really useful as an annex and not a separate dwelling because you've either got to go through Shillingsbury to access it or through this side access. So it doesn't have um, you know, an access or, or, or a separate entrance in effect. Uh, that's just the view, uh, Google Street view again, with uh, Shillingsbury on the right, the neighbouring cottage here, and then showing the relationship with the listed church. So looking through uh, from Church Lane, um, oh, pardon me, uh, through from Church Lane, this is the, the garage belonging to the neighbouring building. This is the access to what used to be the farmland. We can see the workshop building above the gates and garage uh, and the sort of supporting walls that would be reinstated. So in effect, the roof would be reinstated um, sort of beneath these overhead cables. And this is now within um, the garden of Shillingsbury, looking to the flank of the building um, where this roof would be reinstated. This would remain single story. And that is really just to, to show members the relationship um, with the church. Um, it's great one listed. The relationship doesn't really change because we're reinstating a roof that was there originally, apart from Velux windows, which the conservation officer is happy with. And again, just a, a wider prospect showing um, that relationship and, um, and the rear of um, Shillingsbury itself. Then this is this is a view, um, the one I showed you earlier with the with the garage and the gates. This is just a view over the gates, um, showing the relationship with the neighbour. And behind this new fence, that's the strip of land which has been purchased along with the um, with the workshop from the, from the neighbour who owns this garden. And then that's just a view the other way, uh, looking east towards uh, the the, the neighbouring property Brookfield, and that they're the um, they're the, the people who've submitted the letter in support of the application, just to say that um, the applicant's doing a very good job of, of reinstating and refurbishing the existing buildings and and they consider we do the same good job on on the new the new proposal. That's the view um, with the properties to the rear. And then just showing um, the separation between um, uh, the, the application property and those properties to the rear. And then that's the view up the side, the little bit of land that's been uh, purchased for access and maintenance. Just a few more photos showing the relationship with the with the listed church. And then panning out onto main roads because of the lack of parking. Um, if there's additional parking as a result of the annex, um, then the likelihood is that, that that parking would happen on on the main street in Western Zoyden. So um, members can see that um, there are no traffic restrictions, but uh, my experience is that that area outside the church does get quite heavily parked. Um, however, you know, one or maybe two additional um, cars as a result of the annex um, wouldn't be uh, detrimental in terms of, uh, of highway safety. And obviously as a a workshop building or former farmer building, it, it would have generated some demand for, for parking and if we used as a workshop, it would generate some parking demand of itself. So um, officers are of the view that despite the parish concerns, understandably because you know things get busy in Main Street, um, there's not a significant increase in uh, parking pressure as a result of, of this change of use to an annex. So in conclusion, uh, the principle of development, um, the reuse of an existing uh, traditional building within the historic core of the settlement boundary is considered to be sustainable and acceptable. Uh, heritage considerations have been addressed and the conservation officer is happy. Um, as I just said, uh, it doesn't generate a significant amount of parking. It is regrettable that there's no additional on-street parking, but the situation is what it is. Um, and it won't give rise to any undue concerns and certainly not amount to, um, you know, to, to a hazard. Um, 
and in terms of neighbouring residential amenity, um, the building is sufficiently far and due regard has been paid to window positions, velox window heights and so on, uh, that no implications arise for residential amenity. So we'll recommend an approval, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Perry. Um, yeah, I do actually live in the village of Western Zoyland and I know the road that main road is extremely busy. Um, we have um, at the end, it's at the end of an airfield, which towings regularly uses 30 to 50 trips on a, with a skip lorry each day coming up and down that road, plus um, uh, Durston Garden products, which are also got huge lorries. So that um, road, to park along that road, is is extremely dangerous and nobody i'd recommend just park there overnight it's it's not it's, it's not sensible to be perfectly honest with you um and there's no other facility for parking with the um with that annex i can see why they it's a nice attractive building and to put a roof on it but the parking issue is just it's just terrible there sorry thank you any other comments or questions from members? Yep, Councillor Batty. <clears throat> I can only echo what my fellow ward member states about their road. Um, the picture there doesn't do justice with what goes on daily there. The cars are pretty much parked right up to the junction. The cars coming out of the junction either by the pub or in this area here you can see they have to be near enough halfway out in the road to actually see anything that's coming i don't believe having more cars parked along there would make the situation any better and i cannot support it in this way thank you okay mr lloyd did you want to comment or at all thank, thank you chairman um i mean i fu I, I fully understand that and and I, as I've driven down there a number of times myself, it, 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 it is busy. It's it's often it's often parked, um, you know, right through up up until the evening. Um, there are no parking restrictions there, so clearly highways don't consider it to be a hazard. Otherwise, the, 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 there'd be yellow lines there. Now, if if this was a new development that was being proposed in the in in the, the village, you know, additional substantial additional floor space, then quite rightly. We would be looking for um, for parking to go to go with that development. The way that we've looked at it is 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 pragmatically that it's an existing building. It's been you know part of the village core and used for you know many many years, and its reuse um, would um, would be beneficial in terms of removing an eyesore and the relationship with neighbours and the setting of the listed building and as you can see you know one one neighbour has, has written in in support on, on the on those grounds that they they want to see the building um brought back into usefulness and this is one good way to do that um the reality is that that, that there is no available parking um and so we're left with this with with, with a less than desirable situation but you know that that's that's the the planning process often and and that that's the choice so you know we we either allow um what is really a low key use in in terms of an annex um and allow the refurbishment of that building for a use which will you know probably generate a, a minimum amount of parking or potentially the building doesn't get refurbished or it gets refurbished and put to its lawful use as a as as a workshop not requiring permission, but which itself could generate a parking demand locally. Um, that might be slightly different demand in terms of it's more likely to be um, a demand during the day. Um, perhaps, you know, with an annex, if if they've got relatives there, they, they'd probably be parking there overnight, for example. Um, and so I think I think the choice that members have um, is a pretty simple one. Um, we either allow the um, the refurbishment of the building for a low key appropriate use within the centre, um, or you know potentially the building is left to um, to 
you know, rack and ruin, or it's refurbished for its lawful use as a workshop, in which case, you know, we don't have the control and it could generate whatever parking it generates. So um, I think the fact that highways have chose, you know, to, we've asked them to look at it again and they've just said standing advice applies. Um, you know, standing advice is that ideally um, you provide parking for residential. It's primarily about new build, but clearly that that, that applies to existing buildings. Um, so yeah, it, it it's it's a, it's a shortcoming of the scheme that they can't provide the parking, but I don't think it's 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 terminal, and I don't think it amounts to um, to an unsafe highway situation. That would be my my conclusion, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Pierce. Partly been covered what I was going to ask. It's about how much traffic this um, building is likely to generate. And I notice condition six is that it's for activities ancillary to the existing dwelling in class C3. And I know I should know this, and I apologise if I've missed it within the report. But C, can you clarify what C3 is, please? Of course, nice. of course, Councillor Pierce. It's it, that, that that C3 is just a dwelling house. So, so in effect, what we're saying through this is is that that accommodation can be used by members of the same household as Shillingsbury, but not sold, let, or occupied separately uh, as a uh, as an independent dwelling with by a different household because. That a diff the use by a different household generates a, dish a, a different and an additional level because you have different visitors to different households where you have the same visitors to the, to the same household. So, um, in effect, there's a there's a reduced parking demand from an annex than there is from a separate dwelling house. Thank you. Um, given that reply, um, I am happy to propose the officer's recommendation. Thank you. Councillor Evans. Um, I'm just trying to understand, get, I understand this correctly, that highways are saying that standing advice applies and their standing advice says they should be parking and there isn't any. So, 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 so standing advice refer, re refers officers to, to the parking standards. Now that, that, that's, that's parking standards f for new developments, but, but because it, it it, it can't it, standard advice can't encompass every every situation. So, if, for example, if they were building a new annex, then we would expect them to provide off street parking for that new building. Obviously, with 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 a with an with an existing building, and you've got no parking, there is no possibility of them providing parking. So, so it's a it's a less than it's a it's a, a less than satisfactory situation that they can't provide additional parking for the proposed new annex, but it is an existing building. Just before you Sorry, uh, uh, just just one moment, Councillor Evans. I've also got Mr. De Vries was going to answer that as well, okay. and I've also got Mr. Noon wanting to answer as well. Okay, so. I feel I feel. Overwhelmed. You've got them all. That's right. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, standing advice is incredibly helpful, but standing advice is also quite limited. There isn't a bit in Somerset County Highway standing advice that covers annex accommodation. So there is a bit that covers new accommodation. So if we were looking at it as new accommodation, it would generate the requirement for parking spaces. But it, whilst it is providing a form of new accommodation, it's through conversion of an existing building that would have had an existing use that would have could have had some traffic generation associated with it. As annex, we view it within planning as kind of an extension to a residential property because usually it's overflow ancillary accommodation for residential property. If you're looking at an extension to a property understanding advice, there wouldn't be a requirement to provide parking, but there is for new dwellings. But standing advice isn't always helpful, which is why we've gone back to highways and said, can we have a proper comment? And they've just referred us to standing advice again. So based on the situation on site, and the limitations of the site that already exist, officers are happy that we probably couldn't support a refusal on the absence of parking, but we can't directly translate standing advice either. And Mr. Noon, just before I come back to Councillor Evans. Uh, just in terms of the way standing advice is interpreted on these things, in terms of just you know the day-to-day -day nuts and bolts of planning considerations, mm -hmm. their standing advice refers to the number of parking spaces for a new dwelling based on the number of bedrooms. 
So when we get a planning application in a householder application in to extend a two bedroom house into a four bedroom house, we look at how many extra parking spaces that generates, demand that generates based on those bedroom numbers. So in this case, I, I think it's one extra bedroom, is it, Ian? It's two, Adrian. Two, two extra bedrooms. So normally yeah, that would be factored in um, into a, a householder application. And very often we do say to people, you need to provide an extra parking space to reflect the fact your house has got bigger. It's a very crude tool because obviously not every house has an occupier in every bedroom who has a car. So it then becomes a bit more vague in terms of if someone can't provide the level of parking that they would be required to based on the number of bedrooms, we have to look at what harm would arrive over, arise over and above the existing situation, where clearly these applicants' cars already park out on the road. How many more cars would this facilitate? And would that additional parking pressure on road amount to something that is so unsafe that it would be a severe highways impact that would justify a refusal? OK, we're now in the hands of you guys. Obviously, the two ward members feel strongly about this. It's a matter of judgment for you in terms of, you know, there is a shortfall, but it, it, there already is one. Is it so much worse? Would it be so much worse that it, it justifies refusal? And our advice is not in this instance. Councillor Evans. So, County Highways have said standing advice applies. We've yep. said, are you sure? They've said, yes, it does. And you're telling us we're not really sure that it does because it doesn't really apply to this situation. Shouldn't we be batting this back to highways and say this isn't good enough? I, I don't think that's the case. I think by interpretation of the advice by the number of bedrooms in a house, we can infer what the parking standard would be. And we routinely do that on householder applications where additional bedrooms are added. We have to bear in mind that sometimes where there is no um, off street parking available, does that mean we're going to say no to every extension that adds a bedroom? And then we have to sort of be pragmatic and based on our knowledge of the local highway network and the likely harm that would arise. And obviously the NPPF puts that threshold of harm at severe when dealing with highways impact. But surely if, it, if, if we're being pragmatic, then that is going back to standard advice. I think with the standing advice, yeah, we have tried to be pragmatic here. There is no option to provide additional parking here. Um, you know, that the, the current house currently has none. How many additional cars can we say would definitely arise from this scheme on the hot road? And what would the impact of that be? I'd say our advice is that it wouldn't be so severe as warrant refusal. Um, obviously, members may well disagree on that. I would suggest if you are minded to refuse this on highways grounds you may want to consider whether or not it is worth getting highways to comment specifically on this issue before you make the decision because obviously if they look at it and then advise us well you're on your own as far as defending an appeal that puts us in a difficult situation i i think i appreciate that ed and thank you for your advice i think it's i, I don't think these are grounds necessarily for refusal but i think it's grounds for reference back to say can we can we actually have some advice from from highways rather than than this this poor response of standing advice? If, if I come to Mr. Cabrita, then I've also then got Councillor Hendry and Councillor Grimes have indicated. So, yeah, un unfortunately, it is what we've done. You know, we we got standing advice. It doesn't comply with standing advice. We've gone back to them and said, can we have some slight specific comments? And they've given us standing advice again. So, with without. I would be very, very nervous recommending it for refusal against standing advice without a written comment from them actually recommending refusal. And, and given what officers have seen out on site and the scale of impact, we've made a judgment based on that. Whilst it conflicts with standing advice, we don't think it's so significant that we'd recommend refusal. But unfortunately, we did bounce it back and we didn't get anything other than standing advice. Chairman, can I can I just say um, that yeah, the, 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 the the aerial photograph that I've got up there at the moment, um, the 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 space at the side uh, of Shilly, uh, of Shillingsby here, where you, where you can see that 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 white car, and uh, by by agreement with the owners of Brookfield, um, Shillingsby presently have um, space to park two of their cars in this at, at the side of their building. But that's that, that, if I could just ask you again to use your pointer. Oh, I'm sorry. So, yep. So, 
so 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 the, the, this this white car here so um there's 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 a, there's a space for a couple of uh, of cars to the side of Shillingsbury, which the owners of Brookfield allow Shillingsbury to, to use as parking. But but that that there's no formal agreement. That that's by grace and favour. And if Brookfield was ever sold um, and a different occupier came in and said we don't want you parking there, then they'd have no right to park there. But for you know for the past and present foreseeable future, they've got some off street parking that, that they use, but it's not guaranteed. We couldn't condition it, for example. Okay, thank you. And, and, and there's no additional capacity there for the, for the annex parking. Okay, Councillor Hendry. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We have applications like this regular. And on the last meeting we had, there was one at Rooksbridge where they wanted to, to make a, a, a standard house into a children's home or something like that, as I recall, and there was a big argument about parking. No matter how you break this down or cut this down, you will never get this to be a perfect application. Not this is not an isolated incident. It happens regular. But you can never make something like this and say that's absolutely perfect. It doesn't work that way. As it is, it's acceptable to highways. They, it, it is acceptable, so that's good enough for me. Everything else that goes with it is absolutely fine as it stands. I have no hesitation to say it's okay, grant permission. I'm happy to second Councillor Cathy Peer. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Grimes. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I was just going to ask the question workshop, if the workshop was refurbished, um, would there be any restrictions on what they could do with that workshop? So if there isn't, then I think. Um, the application before us is far better than a possible workshop that could be turned into a workshop for a, a garage or or something else, which you're going to get vehicles to anyway. So I'm happy with the recommendation. Thank you, Chairman. Mr Lloyd, did you want to answer that? And I think Mr Noon has just put his hand up as well. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm, because because there's no planning history on it, and and, and it's it's a long-standing building. Um, I, I I guess it, you know it could be put to a number a number of uses. It's it, I'd say it's more likely to be light industrial than heavy, but you know it it it, it, it is an implication. You know, as I said in the presentation, you know if it can't be used for this, the likelihood it will is it will be used for something, and that that generates a potential for for, for parking demand. Thank you, uh, Mr. Noon. And then I'm not seeing any other indications, so we'll be coming to a vote at that stage, Mr. Noon. I was just going to uh, just urge a little bit of caution on any fallback position that existing building may have, judging by the state of it, Ian. It may, you know, it it may have lost whatever use it may have had previously. So I I would urge caution, giving weight to what could go on in that building without planning permission until you know for sure what could. So I I would suggest members set that aside. Um, because it's not clear what level of activity could occur in that building without so a further grant of permission. Okay, I'm not as I'm not seeing any further indications. So, members, the proposition that I've had, or the, the motion that I've had proposed and seconded, is to go with the officer recommendation of uh, grant permission. All those in favour of that recommendation, please show. And those against, please show. One, two, three. I think that's all members voted. That's 11. Right, that is clearly carried, so permission is, is granted. I believe that brings us to the end of the applications that we have before us today. Uh, we covered the reports this morning, so I don't think there's any further business. So thank you all very much, and we will close the meeting. Thank you. <laughs>